All right, I will call our work session to order. Um, our first presentation that we so uh, if you want to address, yeah. So before we get started on our first presentation, um, as you know, today we sent out some information regarding a school shooting that occurred. And um, over the last year or so, there have been a number of events that occurred um, across the nation, sometimes that are directly impacting schools, sometimes that aren't. And uh, we oftentimes find ourselves in a situation where we're having to make decisions about, as a district, what is it that we send information out on to the entire community, and what don't we send information out on? And so we wanted to just spend a couple minutes here. I'm going to ask Beth to do this. She's handing out some information regarding um, social issues, events, and tragedies, and, and really the criteria by which we decide to send something out or not, just to share that information with you so that it's so that it's clear for people. Um, Beth and I are now at the RAM. Uh, we, when something like this occurs, we, we meet and we have a conversation and we make decisions about um, how we're going to move forward and what the information is that would go out. So let me give Beth an opportunity to talk through this. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, this question has been coming up, and I wish that part of the impetus behind that wasn't that we have just so many horrendous, unspeakable acts happening all around our country and the world and you know even in our own our own communities um it's a very difficult and unsettling time for all of us and um i think we find ourselves in in a tough spot in education because you know mission centric for us is educating students and of course ensuring that they have a safe inclusive and um, welcoming environment in which to learn. And we do things that, you know, to some degree might seem outside of our mission, like making sure that they have food and mental health supports and different things like that. But that all goes toward ensuring that our kids have what they need to come to school, ready to learn and ready to absorb education. There are things that happen that really present as fairly disruptive to that environment. And when those things happen, um, we sometimes find ourselves needing to take a step that we don't normally take, which is to kind of make statements and take positions on things that are happening that, you know, could realistically be considered social issues or events or tragedies. Um, while we realize that it's really not necessarily our place to be making statements and positions about those things on a regular basis, there are certain times where these things cross over into our schools and uh, whether they have significant relevance, like today's um, horrible actions down in Texas with the school shooting, obviously that is a direct nexus to um, to our schools and our students, uh, or whether it's an event that has such a disruptive impact across multiple schools that it's something that we need to bring to the forefront. Um, those are the times when we kind of decide, okay, has this event risen to the level where we would take a stand and make a public statement about that? Um, we always, regardless of the scenario, make sure that our administrative staff have access to resources and documents that provide um, information about how to appropriately deal with this in the classroom. You know, if things are coming up for your students, how do you have a respectful and open discussion about certain topics so that kids can feel like they can voice their concerns, like they can be heard. Um, those are always provided in the background. It may not always be, you know, completely visible to the broader community when we're doing those things. Um, but we do have a pretty robust set of resources that are that are always available on our website. We have a whole website that we developed several years ago called Keeping Students Safe, and it goes through all the different system structures and staff and other adults that we have in place that are available to help support our schools and our students and our staff at times when things happen that are just beyond the scope of reason in our society. So. Um, 
just wanted to take a moment to kind of explain that a little bit more. Um, I unfortunately we had this this incident happen today that that gave a reason to really give it focus here at the beginning of this meeting. But um, you know, hopefully these are helpful documents and what I shared was was somewhat useful. If there are additional questions, uh, certainly willing to take those. I don't need to be the only one answering, but certainly any member of our team can do that. We are fortunate enough tonight to have some representative of our Black Family Village Advisory Committee here with us today. If you guys want to move up to the table and join us, that would be awesome. If there's any online, can we have them turn cameras on, whatever they're comfortable with doing? So if you guys remember a couple of years back, pre-pandemic, Travis um, and another administrator in our district working with some of the people that you see on the screen as well as in the audience, worked together just forming our first Black Village Family Advisory Camp Committee. And since then, um, they had one in-person meeting followed by a series of a, almost a year and a half, two years where it's been all virtual. Uh, they meet on a monthly basis and Shira's here with us as well as Anna who's online. David, Jamai Cherry, and then we have two um, also people who um, help contribute, which is Olsen Miller and Zaylee, Dr. Zaylee Sampan Aikens. But Shira is going to be presenting along with um, the family, uh, the members who are online with us. So thank you for having me. Okay. Um, thank you, board, for having us back. Um, we met about six months ago. Um, this is Anna Wewa Bradley of the Black Family, uh, Black Village Family Advisory Committee. We usually say Black Village for short. Um, thank you for acknowledging, I guess, the shooting that happened in Texas. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge that too. Um, and being that the kids are so young, um, you know, when things like this happen, it's a shock. But at the same time, as we heard earlier, it's becoming more and more frequent. Um, so we just want to acknowledge that to you today. Um, next slide, please. So our mission, um, for those that don't know, as um, Francesca was saying, we recently started about two years ago. So our role as um, advisory committee is here to advocate for our students, um, the Black students in the Hillsborough School District and the families of those students. Um, and we do that by listening to our students, our families, trying to see where the barriers are um, and also try to elevate our students' voices so they can be heard as well. Um, and we've been working with the equity team this year, um, Ms. Francesca's team. Thank you so much. It's been an honor working with um, her team as well. And then also Travis Raymond started us off with his team, which was very helpful um, during the lockdown and the pandemic times. Next slide. So these are our board members. Um, I'm Anna, I'm the chair. We also have Jemiah Cherry, who is the co-chair. Um, David Steiner, which is the treasurer and our um, facilitator, meeting facilitator as well. David, if you can wave. Um, there's Shira Longstrand, who's our secretary, and she's there in the room with you all. And then Jelana Canfield um, was our secretary, so board member, and she cannot be here with us today. Next slide. So part of the work we are doing is trying to see if we can get Black Village reps um, represented representatives in each of the schools. So right now, these are our main representatives. Um, until we expand, the goal is to be a liaison to the administration and the staff at the school and see how we can pull our families together to do more local school-based type work. Next slide. And these are the things that we've done so far this year. Um, we've had, we do have family meetings every month, like Francesca mentioned. So um, our discussion this year has been on trauma and how trauma is affecting kids and our families. Um, so we've been 
discussing that and also looking to resources that we can give families so they can advocate depending on what their child is going through um, so they can have more access. So we've been doing that. We've also worked with the Preschool for All initiative. Um, they came to kind of hear from us to see what um, our families would like to see in preschool. Um, as some of you may know, suspensions and expulsions happen in preschool too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for Black students, that's higher than any of the students, even at that level. So um, that was one of the things that they were wanting to hear from our families. What are some things that they would be supportive to kids at that age and their families? Um, we also heard from the special education department um, came to meet with us just to go over the IEP and the 504 process and just the special education process overall. So our families are aware of how that um, resource works. And we're hoping to build um, more partnerships there as well. And um, we've been working with our uh, SRO and also making connections with the Hillsborough Police Department, Sergeant Leland Gilbert, to see how we can form more partnerships and also how they can support us and the resource officers in the schools as well. And then last but not least, black hair has been a topic. It's been an issue. Um, those of you that know there's the Crown Act um, that came into play just because there tends to be bias around black people's hair and sometimes it's seen as a distraction. And other times um, students may be asked to either redo their hair or do something because of that reason. So um, our families, we met with presenter Janine Smith to kind of go over the history of black hair, the role it played historically in African societies, the role it plays to our community and um, how that's ingrained within our culture. Next slide. And we also wanna acknowledge the work that the district have done, has done so far. Um, we've recognized that you all have acknowledged that there's need for equity and have been having or starting to have those conversations to be more anti-racist, more inclusive and in how to do that. And, um, and we're willing to partner with you all as well um, and give feedback. So we just wanna acknowledge that commitment that you all have made. And um, like I mentioned earlier, we've been working with the equity department that um, the district has put in, in place. And so we just have a special thank you to Francesca and her team. Um, we see that they've been working really hard. Um, we also see that they've been putting out fires throughout the districts too for different things that have been happening. So we're hoping they can get more support. Um, we'll speak to that too, as far as staff support. Um, and we also see that the district is starting to do more innovative type approaches to discipline. Um, we talked to Francesca and her team about, you know, different ways to hold students accountable to do healing work versus more of suspension and expulsions. Next slide. So the main reason we're here today and we're wanting to meet with you all is because of the experience our students are facing in the schools. Um, we've been hearing from students and parents that kids are being called the N-word um, and nothing's being done or they're not sure what's being done. Staff is confused about how to respond when incidents happen. Um, so we just have some snippets on the slide of what's you know, some students have said some themes that have come up as we've been meeting with folks so far. Um, and then you all on the board can speak to um, if you all have any stories or things that you want to highlight specifically to let the board know. I wanted to just take a second to uh, mention that large one, microaggressions. I know uh, one of the things that it's uh, been kind of reflective. You all have access to this slide deck and all the supporting, um, you know, statistics that come with it. But um, one of the things in particular was during the uh, pandemic time with online students that, that, that 
the I guess kind of one of the release valves of that was was the fact that uh, microaggressions were were kind of seen as happening less. And I know as a parent of a Hillsboro Online Academy student, um, I know that that is something where uh, we feel pretty happy about the fact that that's that's something that's been um, the other experience with the other black families that we've talked about is how uh, you know there's that 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 is less in there but that is something that is uh, obviously the biggest thing that uh, that was brought up amongst families mm -hmm. so we're hearing that um, some of our students are not feeling safe at school um, some of the staff and the students are feeling invisible um, so yeah, we just want to have that discussion with you all to see how um, our students and Black staff can be more supported. Yeah, I was going to add to that, Anna, and I know that we get to it in other slides, but um, also to, to have more representation and, and teachers um, and adults that, that look some of, you know, that uh, look like the students that uh, you know we're speaking about today, and oh. sorry, I'm going to have to change uh, earpieces. Mm -hmm. So we just want to know from you all how you know, and, and I know some of you are not in the schools, um, but if you all have heard similar themes, have heard similar things as well. Sorry, Anna, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I apologize for that. My AirPods connect to my phone on accident, knock me off. Um, but no, representation and having, um, you know, more teachers of color in the schools as well. I'll speak up about the slide too. Um, one of the things that I heard when I was in um, high school was we've made leaps and bounds and really worked hard on making sure that our Latinx population feels welcome, but we haven't done the same for our Black students and we don't even know where to start. And I think that says a lot. We were just talking yesterday as a leadership team about how do we go about providing the skill set necessary for our staff to interrupt incidents when when they're happening. Um, we had the opportunity to talk with a group of students, I'd say that was last week or maybe the week before, and um, and we heard similar things about um, names, inappropriate names being used in the hall, um, inappropriate incidents, and I think there was. The takeaway for the adults that were part of that conversation was that we don't believe all of our staff feel comfortable or have the skill set to do that in a life. And so that is a focus for us uh, as we move forward. We just started talking about it yesterday, and we will be putting a plan in place to make sure that whether it's role playing or sharing specific strategies for interruptions, uh, that's part of the conversation that we had yesterday. Okay. I, I would just add that um, I think this conversation is not just happening in our district, but it's in every school district in Oregon. And I think um, there was a, a change in the OSAA regarding sporting events when things were happening, especially trying to figure out what what organization is in charge of correcting the behavior? Is it at that level? Is it the school that's hosting? Is it the school that came? So there's all these conversations happening about that. But I think, well, what I took away more from the conversation that at the state level was there, we have a caucus of, <clears throat> of school board members of color and having this conversation about how do we, how do we draw this hard line to say, this is abuse. And so how do you ensure that you're protecting students and that you treat it just like any other type of abuse that happens, that there's a reporting mechanism or that there's something that you can do? And so I know that I've heard this challenge also from my other school board members across the state and trying to advocate for a solution statewide that impacts all districts. 
because it is dysregulated. Like kids can't learn if they don't feel safe. So <clears throat> beyond that, I'm thinking about like, what do we do here in our district <clears throat> while we're waiting for, you know, legislation or state to change? Like, what can we do here in figuring out is it training staff? Um, also just thinking about the thought process of, I know it says like microaggression, but really for me, it's abuse, it's child abuse. So that's the way that I see when, when I look at this, is thinking it about that way and that kids can't learn if they're not feeling safe. But yeah. I know even that, changing the vocabulary that sometimes we use when we're talking about these incidents. It's traumatizing. And yeah. like our students, I mean, we'll probably get onto this in one of the slides and, and Jemai, you know, talked about it. Like they don't feel safe in these schools and are choosing to go online instead. Like if you sit with that, if you really think about that, like they would rather be outside of your school than in it. Like how does that make you feel? It's um, it, it's interesting that um, let me go back. Thank you for saying that acknowledging that teachers don't know how to deal with it. Step one. Okay, good. Glad we can all agree that the teachers may not know how to deal with it, but we can't stop there. So the question is then, what's the next step? What what do we do? How? How do we make our teachers feel comfortable in their discomfort in dealing with children who don't look like themselves, who are not from their particular uh, upbringing, who don't speak their same native tongue at home? And, and I think that's where it's, that's where the rubber hits the road for me. Um, my day job's in the same situation. The exact same situation where we're trying to get people to be comfortable with their discomfort and interrupting microaggressions when they occur, but it's not helpful if you don't know what a microaggression is because of your privilege. Now, I don't want to use privilege as a negative word. It's actually a good word. I was at a conference last week, and I've now come to understand that I have privilege, and I acknowledge that. And now that I know that, it makes me look totally different at the whole spectrum, but I do think there is something else that we can do. At some point, we have to ask, we have to hold accountable that there is some level of, you have to open your mind and understand that just because it doesn't bother you, doesn't mean that it's not gonna bother this child. And, and I think that's kind of what I'm thinking. I don't know what the next step is, but if the next step is, I volunteer. I'll go stand in between or in front of all the teachers. I'll go to every school if that's what it takes. To say, can we talk about this? Can we can we talk? I need you to be comfortable because these are our children. And for some of us, we only get one shot. I got one. That's it. That's all. If I mess up with him or something happens to him, I'm out the game. And I think about that all the time. And even where he is, and people claim that they know who board members are, you would never know it by how my son is treated. So I don't know. I it just I just want to make sure that we're thinking as a board, as a district, there has to be a point where we come to the where we agree that there's a problem that might take some work. Because once again, we have people who feel a particular way because they don't see. It. It's just like when someone tells you there's no racism. Okay. That means that you think the sky is purple and I see it as blue. And when we can't agree on the color of the sky, we got a problem. So just saying, it would be nice to start having that conversation as well. And I'm telling y'all volunteering, if it takes having some sit down conversations, I'm happy to do it because it's just as uncomfortable for me. Just as uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's one of the things we've been talking about is being uncomfortable is, is not a bad thing. Um, talking about race, talking about culture, making that normal in the school environment. 
um, you know, so people see, feel seen and heard. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, so we have some statistics. We gave you all a full presentation before we came, but in the interest of time, we had to cut some things. So if you see something with an I and a slash through it, it's we're trying to focus on certain slides, but you all should have, you know, the full presentation at your disposal, we heard. Um, so I'll turn it over to Shira to go for some of the, um, the stats. Next slide. Um, so like she said, you guys have access to even more up-to-date data. If you want it, you can ask your data analyst. These are just from ODE, and we're going to go through just like the picture it paints. So um, basically, we can see there's a disproportion between the number of students and the Black educators we have for representation. Next slide, please. And you can see that less than half of our schools have a licensed Black educator in them. Um, these are the slides we skip. I'll just give you kind of like a little rundown. Um, the data shows that students had better outcomes over lockdown. Graduation rates increased, dropout rates decreased, discipline rates decreased. Hillsborough Online Academy went from one Black student enrolled in 2019 to 25 Black students enrolled in 2021. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, Anna, are you going to take this one? <laughs> so I can take it, or David can. Oh, yeah, I think that's me. I can jump in. to speak to some things. Yeah, either or. I think we can, you know, we'll jump to some questions here and just have a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. But this slide is just a follow up to a board meeting I believe we had back in October. Um, and, and in the meetings that we have monthly, I mean, especially leading up to this one today, we obviously want to make the most of, of our time and this partnership we have together. Um, I like the conversation we're having so far. And, and Nancy, I appreciate you sharing too, because this board, we only have so far reach you know we talk about this stuff on the daily and i know that this isn't a topic in your boardroom um you know when you when you meet each month so we're, we're passionate about it and, and we appreciate and, and are thankful for the opportunity um but we also want to see change and and output um and some results as well but this first question um the school district, you know, had said we make mental health and well-being of uh, Black students a priority. What steps have been taken to improve the outcomes for Black students? And then the second question, um, which hits home to me because I just got an email today. My daughter goes to West Union. So, um, you know, I, I'm a bit disheartened today. But the school district had said it wants more representation at each school. What steps have been taken to recruit Black educators? as well as to retain them. And I'll just hand that over to whomever wants to answer those. See, when we, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn to Brandon Dale to uh, help with some of the answers we need. When we, I'll state the first on that, the mental health and well-being of uh, students making that priority. Um, just the fact that transposition is in place now and the team that she has is focusing on the social emotional well-being of, some of, our, of our students. I think that's a step that we have taken. Um, our goal, of course, is to systematize the support so that it's easily accessible to all students. Some of the ways that that has occurred is by the lessons that occur for all students throughout the school year, um, we, where that has been an improvement that we've made. Um, Fran, do you want to talk about some of the other mental health supports that are in place? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. For the mental health support that we have in place, we've put in our most, a lot of our buildings, I won't give you an exact number because I don't have it clearly in my head, it might be around eight, we've put life stands inside our schools so that students who need mental health, um, wellness, or behavioral support have access to a healthcare provider within their building. Um, they also take in, um, medical insurance, as well as OHP. Um, some other things that we've done is working with our care coordinators, as well as our 
um, student success coaches and wellness instructors as we develop wellness programs. Silesia has worked um, closely when um, for most for the most part this year with our wellness instructors, really building a robust wellness program because we know that the tier one supports for all of our students, including those that identify as black needs to be district wide. And so she's working closely with them and with our student success coaches, which are in our elementary schools. In our high schools, we also have um, grad coaches and in middle school um, students, what's the name? student support and wellness counselors, mm -hmm. student support and wellness counselors that have also been funded to ensure that our students have um, in the moment um, people that can help with their mental health health services. As far as recruitment, I think Connor can speak to different re um, recruitment and been, um, ventures that she's been on lately, but know that when we talk about, or, or Del for that matter, know that when we talk about the mental health and well-being, we really try to see it as a universal support for everyone. And then for those who need a tier two or a, a strategic or intervention type support, we backfill that with different resources, whether it be outside their school counselor, um, outside agencies, um, connecting them with mentorships um, to make sure and ensure that there is um, that their mental health and well-being is a priority. I know that Dr. Finn, um, Jessica, Cardi Mercado, and myself have been out um, working with even some of Olga's um, friends in the family um, engagement department to really make contact with our students who do identify as Black. That's the most beautiful story from last week, but uh, I'll share that story for Dr. Kidd to share another time. Um, we also have Cairo, which um, we brought this year, which specifically looks at our students who identify as Black, um, but are in, of immigrant status. Um, and so, um, Goulet, who is in charge of the Cairo program, um, is also working to build um, those relationships with our students who identify as immigrants, but from African or um, countries of origin. Dale, or Connor, do you have anything you want to add? I would just add on the first one, um, you know, trying to work. Well, first of all, we started off the year with the board supporting us with two extra days. So the teachers could reach out to families and students and try to connect as uh, the school, and then do um, support with advisory in the morning. Just trying to do things, social, emotional, mental health um, supports, kind of like what Fran was saying, more of like an access to everyone. I, I think it's fair to say that um, we know we want to do more, and we know we could do more. Um, I don't think there's been a day this year that a school has been staffed. We're always short a teacher or classified staff or someone, and and there's a lot of covering and creative um, covering. And I I think it's fair to say that teachers want to do more, and we're looking forward to a more stable year, full staff, so that we can serve the needs. Um, and I I would just add I think the high schools you know, a lot of the work that they've been doing is trying to connect kids with advisors or to connect them with one person. Um, we've had a system of teaming to, to focus on students who might need a little extra support or who might really be struggling. And that number has been really high this year. Um, just across, across the board, we have added one additional counselor this last year. Um, again, that was hard to staff. And so not every school had it out of the gate, but I, I think schools are, are are learning more about our kids and families, and I think they're they're um, doing some good work, and they're ready to start next year and dive into even better work. I'd like to ask a question for follow up. Sure. Not for right now, so I don't expect you to have stats in your head, but I'd love to look and see how much of that is actually being utilized by our black students, okay. and how much they're, they feel like they have access to it. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, and we're in the middle of our um, needs assessment. We do a um, every other year needs assessment with our students in seven through twelve to kind of ask them um, about their experience. It's anonymous, but that gives us some really good information about how kids are feeling in the school, as well as um, things that we're trying to support them, and they they give us feedback there actually. So that's also another bit of information we'll be able to share with you. Like for that need and are we making sure that black students are are filling it out and that they're being reached out and they are able to access that form or deliberately making sure that you know 
we have different groups and that everyone is filling that out because the needs assessment would be useless if, the, if we don't get that information. Absolutely, yeah. We have um, we get data that we look at almost every other day about how much uh, our student population when we get in school has had has filled it out, and so it allows us to know who we need to check in with and make sure they're they're supporting students with time to do it. I <clears throat> excuse me. I also wanted to add that um, when we first when we were first forming our organization and we were talking among each other and when we were talking it was so clear what the answer was it was just crystal clear we need more black teachers let's do it why don't they do it and i have to tell you that at the same time that i made that transition from black village to here i was also making the transition to, uh, professionally in another position and then i realized that there is nothing nothing simple about just hiring another black teacher. There is a massive hiring disruption throughout the state and the country that I have never seen in my adult life. I didn't understand how complex it was. I didn't understand how difficult it is. I just, I didn't get it. And now that I do, I can tell you that they even have programs that I don't know if you all know that, and I'm I'm hoping that um, that Francesca can share that with you, where they try to seed black teachers and Latino teachers at universities just so they'll come here and work, just so they'll come here and work, and it is extremely difficult. And then you have the problem with pay. Everybody wants to be paid as much as possible, which we wish we could, right? If we had our wish, we every teacher again. When I was with you, right, I it was real simple. Hire more teachers. It simply is not as simple. And, and as, even as far as hiring another um, mental health professional, there is a dearth of mental health professionals across the country. We, we meaning the state of Oregon, is even trying to pay medical school bills for people just to come to Oregon. And that's it's so the idea that we can find more that that's more super sensitive and, and culturally specific for our black students and for our Latino students and even even for our our students who are choosing to identify differently, it is absolutely it is it is unnerving how complex it is and it's just not there. And it's not fair, but it's just not there. And I'm just sharing what I'm learning because I'm telling you at one point the answers were simple. And it just, it isn't, and it's painful, and, but they're just not as simple as they used to be. And we could stand on this corner right here. We can advertise across the freaking state. We need black teachers here, but guess who else is asking? 10 other issues. But if we make this place like amazing for black people, if we show that we care and we're willing to work with them, I think that would incentivize people to choose our district over another district. I mean, um, there's all there's been mention of, you know, black educators choosing to leave this district. Yeah. And um, I think to say that the people aren't out there, they don't exist, that's an easy kind of cop out answer when you can't even keep the people you have that you already know are amazing. So not Sorry. I mean, yes, it, it, the hiring is really hard right now. There's, you know, only so many. There is a limited number of Black teachers out there who are willing to work in Oregon. But I have faith in this district. I have hope that we can make this place awesome. And we can then get people to be like, hey, have you heard what they're doing in Hillsboro? They have mentors for us. They have pipelines for us to get you know, higher in the organization. They actually care. They're listening to us. They're not making us feel invisible. And I can say that matters to people. I, I agree with you 100%. I think that they're like what you're saying. This is the, the, the problem doesn't have one single solution, but multiple avenues to try to resolve. Like it's a complex issue. 
Yes, there is a shortage, but there's also about the culture and environment that you create in the district. <clears throat> there's also the license, the license, teacher licensing of um, the regulations that the state imposes when you have other teachers from coming from a different state to try to work here. That is a barrier, and that's something that we can't solve here, but we can advocate at the state level to try to figure out how do we change that or how do we make it so that it's not as difficult if you're already teaching in another state so then you can come and teach in Oregon if you want to teach in Oregon. So I think that there's it's a, a problem that has a lot of different layers, but there's an accountability piece for everybody on this to try to find a solution. There's us as a district, there's even at the school level, and then there's also state agencies and organizations. But it, I think all of us have to kind of take a piece of what belongs to us to try to like change that. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to speak it because I work in human resources <laughs> and one of you know our uh, long focuses has been prioritizing how we can hire more BIPOC staff to represent our students. That has uh, been uh, a very important goal that we've had for many years. And I always say we can do better. It's not just a destination. It's a journey on how we can kind of refine what we're doing and braid efforts together. And I've been kind of thinking as I was listening just on some things that we've been having discussions on. Uh, we have, you know, a grant uh, coming forth from the state around recruitment and retention. And we've been working uh, with HEA to have discussions around how we can hire BIPOC mentors. Because uh, it's one thing to recruit people, but it's another thing to keep them retained. And when you think about all that research that talks about what keeps people in the space, money is a, a portion of it in what you're getting earned, what you're earning. But a larger portion of it has to do with the fact of how connected do those folks feel in the community that they're in and the spaces that they're working. And so we think it's a very important to invest in that. And we've had conversations about uh, putting those funds towards those investments. I think another thing too that we've been thinking about as well is um, there are scholarships out there to help people get into education. And we were discussing yesterday uh, at our executive level about like high school students who have graduated, who you know kind of reach that age of like, you know, I'm, I'm wanting something different. I want to do something different. And so how we can reach out to those kids who are now graduates and have them come back and maybe work as a classified staff member and then find a potential happening with them. And so I think it's those um, also single conversations to help support people and finding out like, what do you need as an individual that might be different than what your peer needs? And we have a TOSA uh, who's been in our uh, with our team for about two and a half years and we've been really trying to focus in on those individualized conversations. And as I said, we want to do better in terms of serving our students and ensuring that we can recruit more Black educators, not only recruit them, but retain them with the supports that they need that are long-standing, because that can make a huge impact on our whole system together. One, one of the things I would add to Connor's comments, if we're just being really transparent here. We have spent a lot of time and energy and resources putting grow your own programs together for bilingual kids. And um, so and we've done a pretty good job with attracting students to that and um, diversifying our workforce in that way and getting bilingual teachers, um, students we support through their college years, they come back and they teach during the summer school and kind of thing, then we hire them as educators. And we've been pretty successful with that. We haven't put the same amount of energy into um, creating a future, a future educator program for for Black students who are working to deliberately build that base. And I think this this conversation tonight this this will spur some action in that area. Um, we have we do a lot of connecting with individuals, with students, with some of our classified staff members to teacher education programs, and we work to you know we work to get discounts, we work to create opportunities and. We can do that as well for um, our black students that would like to become educators. And we can we can do more to attract students to them. So I think this this conversation has been helpful for me just to, to make the expansion of our future educators program to include more students. I mean, I skipped over it, 
but in your packets, you'll have you guys can see the um, educators for like the past five years, and you'll see black educators have stayed at about one percent. But you'll see there is an uptick, and I can tell you, and others, and I can tell you if you break it down, if you if you want to get the analytics and you break it down, every other group has stayed pretty much the same, and it's the Latinx group that's giving you the uptick. So whatever you guys are doing there, <laughs> you're getting some feedback. It's working. And I mean, you can probably hear it from the other pack, you know, but, you know, yeah. we'd like some of that too. No, I understood. I think it's a great next step. For yeah, I was just going to add just briefly, though, with that and what you're doing, do, do you have any metrics for, that are tied to Black recruitment and retention? just to see if your efforts and, and what you're doing is even working. I would, I, I would say there hasn't been a sustained deliberate effort in that area. Yet. If I'm just being perfectly honest, our, most of our resources have gone to recruiting bilingual staff and uh, creating that pipeline uh, because of the need we have. Understand that uh, there's a need here as well, but I don't, I don't think I could honestly tell you that because we've done this, we, we attracted and retained more black teachers. So I, I don't have anything to report on that for you. Mm -hmm. Really an area for us to do. Yeah, in the interest of time, we would like to share with you our recommendations. Um, so oh, we'll skip we'll skip that. This is an area we're we're gonna be trying to do for next year. These are some of our partners that we're working with, but I think it's slide 26. Yeah. So a lot of times when we have the conversation around, you know, recruiting or retaining or doing things for students of color, you know, it's all grouped together. So, but we want to focus on black students and black educators. Um and so these are some of the commitments that we want to see from the district. We don't have time to go into all of these. Um, but the two that we were talking most specifically about is doing a climate check within the schools. Just to kind of see, you know, if the staff and the administration of each school, if they're ready to respond to racial incidents. That can include with students and that can include with staff too. Because um, as we see microaggressions, you know, was one of the themes. Um, and then also if there's a way to bring in culturally responsive liaisons. So when we talk about culture, it goes beyond language. You know, we're talking about different beliefs, different values, uh, bringing a way, you know, a people move through the world. So it's hard to know that if someone is moving a different way in the world to understand the experience of another. So these might be helpful in kind of bridging that gap in understanding. Um, I also, you know, before coming, have asked that you all get a guide. It's called Responding to Hate and Bias in School. Um, and that's a guide that was put together by um, the Southern Poverty Law Center that's based in Montgomery, Alabama. So they've put together a manual that exactly works for how to respond to racial incidences and biases in schools. Um, it's a step-by-step -step guide. There's also, I don't know if there's a way we can pull that up so everyone can see. It's in our packet. We, we, we did it's this. in your packet? Okay. Um, but I think that might be, we were thinking that that might be a helpful st step just to start in doing a climate check. And we heard from Francesca, there's been some surveys going out to kind of capture that information. Um, like I said, we were looking for more specific and not broad. So when it comes to, you know, race and bias, what is the climate like in the schools for responding to those incidents? And this manual treats it more as a disaster plan, like as though you were planning for, unfortunately, like today, a shooting or an earthquake or a fire is coordinated, it's systematic. 
So when something happens, people know how to respond, what to do. It's broken down into, you know, pre-services, prevention, crisis, when a crisis happens in the aftermath, because unfortunately the community is impacted when there's an incident. So the aftermath, how are we doing there? And schools can see as they go through, you know, at the end of the manual, they have ways that a school can check and see, okay, well, we might be good at doing prevention services, but maybe we need to strengthen in responding to a crisis. Or yeah, we haven't thought about follow-up what can we do to be more proactive in following up after an incident? So some of these things where you can kind of get a baseline of, okay, this is kind of what we're needing. Um, You know, and then having some of those conversations around culture, what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, and getting deeper beyond the surface level of what culture means. So that might be going to the discourse level to supporting staff and how they can have those conversations. It might be difficult, but going there, going deeper, leaning in. So you're really getting to learn and know about each other and to model that for students so students can really know and get to learn about each other. You know, um, maybe equity classes, you know, that may look because some parents, you know, we put out some things earlier for students. It was a scholarship work, you know, workshop. It was put on the um, Facebook group. Some of the responses we got were, well, isn't that racist? If we were to do a group like that for white students, there would be an uproar. So having an understanding about what racism is, you know, what that looks like, why some of these groups have special interests, groups tied to them, learning the history, learning the history of Oregon. I mean, there's a history tied to that, too. So then people understand why some things are the way it is now and how to move forward, you know. Um, So the use of the N word, too, you know, like I said, we're hearing from students that this is happening, but nothing's being done, you know. And I had a student say, well, there's responses when, you know, someone misgenders someone. But, yeah, I hear this and in. I don't know. I can't even tell you who to go to, what is being done about that. So, so like I said, we would like you to narrow in on Black students, not just students of color. And if that's a need, then we're willing to support, you know. Um, but we, we strongly believe that doing a climate check would be a good first step. Um, and then even during, you know, responding to the students too. how are students experiencing this? Is it helpful? Is it healing? What would they like to see? You know, by the end of the day, you know, what I got from this manual was that it's a systematic response and it's everybody's job, not just somebody's job that looks like X, Y, and Z and everybody's leaning in because, It takes a village. I mean, that's not just our slogan. It really does take all of us, you know, so no one can put their hands up and say, I'm not black. This isn't my problem. It is your problem. This is a child we're talking about, you know. This is it. This is an incredible list. I love it. Um, Especially the first one. But I think the other... And I know you probably had 40 of them, and then you <laughs> whittled it down to this. I know. But I, I can't keep, I can't help but read the first one. And it says, hire more Black educators. And then I want to say, comma, retain who we have. Yes. I heard, I hear you. Yeah. Retain who we have. So that means that we might have to get a little uncomfortable in having some conversations with our current teachers. And finding, and it's not that many of them, so it's not like we have to have a big meeting. <laughs> we can do it real fast because there's not a lot of them, but to make sure that we're connecting with them intentionally to find out if they have what they need because they professionally may not even have the support that they need to even be comfortable to do the job that they've been called to do. That is a whole nother discussion. But um, I just wanted to let you know, I, I hear you. So, Yes, we need to hire more, but more effectively, right now, what we can't control, 
is the one that we have right now. So thank you. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Can I make a point of privilege? Sure. So we kind of have this understanding that we would get to write our bylaws and be governed by our own bylaws for our PAC. And we were told um, basically that we couldn't have a very valued member of our team be a board member because of their occupation. And we had specifically taken that line out of our bylaws and our membership requirement that they couldn't that they couldn't be a district employee. And we had struck that from our bylaw. And we were told later, much, much later, that even though we took it out, it wasn't enough. We need to add in language saying we allow for district employees to be part of our path. So I just I just want to put it out there that I, I find that kind of odd and, and frustrating. And uh, I'll just leave that there. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for having us. I don't know how much more time we have, but you know, if we're out of time, thank you all. If we have a little bit of time, we can discuss. You know, we can talk a little bit more. But I'm hoping that I'm I'm, I'm hoping you all um, kind of think a little bit more about these commitments and and kind of see where you can go. I, I just also want to say that it takes a lot of strength and courage to like speak truth, especially in this kind of environment where it's very public and you're talking about things that are very, um, quote, you know, and very um, difficult to talk about. But I'm really just proud of all of us for sitting in this discomfort right now of like knowing that, like Mike said, we haven't done this. And there is a lot of work to do. And sorry, that we haven't done enough, but there's a lot of work to do. And there's that palpable discomfort about where we're missing and where we're not hitting things. But really naming those things, calling it out, and making them really visual so that everybody has a piece of accountability, us as your elected officials, and we are accountable to you, our community also our staff, what we um, guide them to do, what we express is our desire to change in our culture as a district, um, and then also in our, our community. And so I, I just want to say, like, it's it's been a journey to even just get here, to have a group that speaks directly to the board and tells exactly what it is that the community needs, so that it's not just coming from leadership to say, Here's what we're going to do, or here's what we're offering. But instead, it's what do you need? And then we take that feedback and then create a plan or strategies of how we're going to change it. And then come back again and say, here's what we did. You're basically starting in some places from nothing. Here's what we're going to do. And then we come back again and show you here's what we did, here's the outcome, or here's what we see change. And then keep having this dialogue over and over until we get to some solutions or until we have some metrics or we see the impact. Um, so I just, I really appreciate the commitments that you laid out. Some of those are for ourselves as board members. Some of those are for our staff. But also, I think for us, is how do we take this and kind of break it down so that we we know what belongs to who, so that there is that accountability piece. So when we come back, we can say, did our board do this work? Did our staff do this work? Or I just want to make sure that it's not just like spoken and then it kind of goes away, but there's like, like who owns this kind of piece. And maybe that's for us in the next work session, taking back what we hear from the tax that we're getting and then saying, what does our administration own? What does our teacher own? And what does the, do we own by board leaders? Uh, I thought, uh, yeah, if there's more discussion, that period we're about a half an hour over, actually. But yeah, if, if there's anything else, it's be sure to. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you so much for creating space for us, um, and and listening into us.
Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Adam, you are in next presentation. All right. Do what I can to get us back on track. All right. Um, I'm here tonight representing the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee. Uh, our chair, Matt Buckingham, wasn't able to be here tonight, nor was Patrick Preston, our vice chair. Uh, but they have reviewed all the information I'm going to share tonight and um, have given me the thumbs up to go ahead with it. So um, could we get our first slide up there? I think they're calling up and we have it in our packet too. There we go. There we go. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as a reminder, this will be our fifth summer um, for our 2017 bond. Um, as you can see to date, we've got about $510 million uh, between the bond sale, bond premiums, interest, um, the um, state awesome grant. We have spent about $447 million of that. We've written checks for that amount. We've got about $60 million, $59.5 million remaining committed, um, leaving us about $3.5, $4 million of uncommitted um, revenues at this point. Next slide, please. This is just a breakdown by year of the bond uh, expenditures. As you can see, this is uh, our, we're, we've kind of peaked and we're coming down the other side. The summer of 2022 will be our smallest, most likely, um, by the time we're done. Um, but we still have some important work to do, and we'll be going over that here shortly. Next slide, please. One of the commitments we made to our community was uh, that we would try to maintain the tax rate uh, that was in place prior to us passing the bond. Um, and I'm happy to report that we're about 10 cents per thousand below um, where we were um, prior to the bond being sold. Has nothing to do with anything we've done. Um, it's the, the property values in the city have continued to increase and that's um, how we arrive at that tax rate. Um, next slide, please. Actually, next two slides. Yeah, one more. So for our upcoming work this summer, obviously our big project is uh, the construction of ES-29, the new elementary school in South Hillsboro. Uh, we have uh, gotten all of the, the site work done on that. We're now uh, pouring footings uh, by this summer. We'll be going vertical with that building. Um, and it will be ready for opening um, in September of 2023. Over the next few months, we'll be working on naming that site, uh, coming up with a mascot, school colors, uh, boundaries. So uh, lots to happen over the next six to eight months, um, but we'll be ready for kids in uh, September of 2023. Next slide, please. Another project this summer is uh, the replacement of the domestic water pipe uh, system at Hare Field. Uh, that project is underway right now, and we expect to have that work done uh, before the start of football season. Next slide, please. The Liberty Solar Array. Uh, you'll remember this is uh, the money that we're required to spend um, as part of the green energy technology program. Um, this project, uh, we had hoped to start in the middle of June. Um, however, we're running into some issues with uh, receiving the, the solar panels. Those are one of those uh, supply chain issues that we're dealing with. So uh, as soon as we get through all that and all the permitting, we'll be, we'll be going vertical with that project. Um, and we don't really have a completion date. We had originally hoped October. Um, not sure that's going to happen, but we can continue with that construction uh, during the school year. So that will be okay. Uh, next slide, please. Tobias Elementary School is getting a new uh, parent bus drop off uh, area. Again, this is the final one of these projects uh, with the intent of separating parents and students and buses and cars uh, to try to make that uh, a more 
a much safer campus for students. Next slide, please. Then we have a whole bunch of kind of miscellaneous projects. We're finishing up our security trio projects. Those are cameras, card access, um, and uh, security systems. Yeah. Um, so we are, we expect by the end of this summer, we will have all of those projects complete. We will have the security trio in all of our buildings, including the, this building, uh, the facilities building, and the transportation building. Um, the good news from a budget standpoint is that we will be then on one monitoring system, um, which is much less expensive and also just a whole lot easier to coordinate. Um, we're also doing the security window film um, at the Century and Liberty Theater. No, we completed Century and Liberty Theaters. Glencoe and Bill Hyde Theaters will take place this summer along with the Oak Street campus and transportation. Security uh, vestibules at those listed schools there um, will be done this summer. The only part that's going to lag a little bit is the actual, the, the card readers themselves are stuck in the supply chain um, process. So um, the construction will be done, but we'll be waiting on those card readers probably till October. Um, emergency lighting. We have emergency lighting in all the buildings, but um, many of them are on a, a battery backup. We're going to be going through and replacing a lot of those with um, the LEDs and replacing the ballasts on those exit lights. Next slide, please. We're doing a lot of fencing work this summer, kind of miscellaneous stuff around the district, as you can see there, um, security gates, at some campuses, uh, we're going to be enclosing the uh, playgrounds uh, at a couple of buildings. We're going to be replacing, or we're, we built a new trash enclosure at Minter Bridge. Uh, we're going to be fencing that. Um, so lots of, uh, again, more security related items. Next slide, please. <laughs> We've got a lot of work going on in this building this summer. In fact, um, starting in June, I think we'll be, um, taking over the main entrance um, to install the new security vestibule. Um, we have work going on in the data center down below, uh, fireproofing that, um, upgrading the servers. And Jordan can give you a whole lot more information on that one. Um, and then we're also converting the little shower room downstairs uh, into a, a restroom. But we'll be taking over this building pretty pretty well. well. We'll continue to have ways to get around it, but there'll be a lot of construction going on here this summer. We also have the, the single pane window replacement projects this summer at Groner, West Union, and North Plains. We're also doing one last HVAC unit replacement at North Plains. Uh, the transportation center on Walnut Street is having a bunch of work done this summer, roofing HVAC electrical upgrade, we're replacing the bus lifts and the uh, mechanics space. Uh, we're putting some skylights in those to brighten up that space. We'll be painting Hill High, the exterior of Hill High. We will be uh, replacing the blacktop play area at uh, Lad Acres with new asphalt, also at Metro Bridge. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the McKinney domestic water pipe uh, system is also being replaced this summer <laughs> and that's on your agenda tonight um, we got two but just to pause I'm supposed to give you a heads up of what that's all about so that when your regular meeting happens you I hope, hopefully answered all the questions you received two bids on that um, one for just under four hundred thousand dollars one for just under eight hundred thousand um, dollars we were happy to be able to report that the four hundred thousand dollar uh, bid the contractor feels confident that this number is good. So um, we had a good bid date, which hasn't happened for a while. So any yeah, reason for concern that we only had two and we usually had one of that? We we reached out to several. We had we thought we were going to get three. The, the day of the bid, we only got the two. Um, but we're we're happy with the contractor that we're planning to award to is Five Star Builders, which is somebody that we've worked with throughout this bond. Uh, have done great work for us. So we have 
but we're confident that they'll do the job for us. Uh, finally, we have some uh, the roof on the gym at which Hazel is being replaced. Uh, next slide. I think that's it. That's it. So that's summer of 2022. Um, I think we've got a total of like 35 projects, but they're much smaller, obviously, to scale. Um, by the end of this summer, we'll be down to just uh, the new school in South Hillsboro. Um, so that's a lot of work. It's been crazy. Yeah. So happy to answer any questions. Um, if unless you just want to get on with them. Any questions, Ryan? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to rearrange some things because the uh, CSE biannual review is like the required thing. So we're going to slot that in next and figure out what we can get to after that. We're going to see what kind of time we have like. All right. So I'll kick this up. I just wanted to thank Becky and uh, Alana Chiliberto and Kristen Romberg. There's a small team of folks who, while subbing at schools, subbing for principals, and managing everything else the last couple of years have kept us up to speed with um, comprehensive sexuality education. And then, you know, there are countless partners and teachers and counselors who've been a part of this conversation. So, so thanks to everybody, but I wanted to recognize uh, Becky for her leadership and she'll do the talking for our team tonight. All right, thank you for having me this evening. As Travis said, I'm Becky Kingsmith. I'm our director for secondary teaching and learning. Um, and I've been um, working on the implementation of our CSE instructional plan since the board approved it in 2019. Um, Kristen Blomberg is kind of our, um, our TOSA on the ground, working most directly with teachers, and then I work pro closely with Kristen on that. So I'm sharing some um, updates for you this evening. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so our presentation goals for this evening is the board will understand the process that we've gone through over the last few years. The board will understand the updates. Um, and then finally, the board and staff will confirm that we have reviewed and updated the plan and that we're in compliance with the OAR that um, pertains to our comprehensive sexuality education instructional plan, which I probably will just use CSE from here forward for sake of brevity. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so just to, to provide some a framework for the OAR and the responsibility of local school boards in the context of this. So the, this is these are excerpts directly from the OAR itself. And the first part is really addressing the role of the school board um, when the initial plan was approved in 2019. So this is where um, we got feedback from local stakeholders, those in the, um, all different areas who are the most knowledgeable of the latest scientific information and effective educational strategies. Uh, we developed the plan and um, that aligned to the Oregon Health Education Standards, and then the school board in 2019 approved that. So the second um, excerpt here addresses that um, after that plan is approved, we are required um, that it will be reviewed and updated biannually in accordance with new scientific information and effective educational strategies. So next slide. Just a quick question right there. Yeah. It, is it still the case that the state doesn't have, you know, these are the three math curriculums. Pick the one that works for you. These are the three languages. It's still, we have to assemble this ourselves. Yeah, yes. There, what the state provides is a comprehensive health education. It does, which includes CSE. Yeah. But um, this is, this OAR calls out very specifically that we have a CSE instructional plan um, within the comprehensive health education. So yes. It, yeah, it's just it's the state continues to ask us to manage it differently than the rest of our curriculum. That is correct. So this is the timeline that timeline that just takes us through the last few years um, since this topic was brought to the school board. So in fall of 2019, we had the approval of our CSE instructional plan. Um, and the intention when, was that um, most of our schools and classrooms were planning to teach their CSE units in spring of 2020. Well, we all know a little interesting thing called COVID-19 <coughs> sprung up in March 2020 that drastically changed how we did education for the remainder of that school year. So um, that was the phase that was called um, distance learning for all. And that is where um, we provided educational opportunities for our students, but we know that um, access and different issues were, were challenges for a lot of our students. So 
Um, it would probably be most accurate to say that we did a partial implementation of uh, the standards in the unit that spring, um, just because of the, you know, what was thrown at us in a very short time period. Moving into the next school year, though, we knew that um, we started that year in the phase of comprehensive distance learning. So we knew that it was a very high potential that our uh, instructional delivery was going to be in a virtual format that year. Great news is that by spring of 2021, we did go to a hybrid model. But even within the context of a hybrid model, we had half of our students with us at a time where the other half of the students were accessing their learning online. And then we also had some students that just stayed online, online for the rest of the school year. And so what that led us to do was make sure that um, all of our CSE instruction was available in a virtual and digital format. So accessible through um, Google Classroom and also on Google Meet, which um, the positive thing that came out of it is it created district-wide slide decks that um, provided a lot of consistency from classroom to classroom across our district of the materials and curriculum um, that the teachers were accessing because Oftentimes, the slide deck is something that might be like a unique to a teacher where the curriculum, everyone uses the same, but they might do their own twist on the slide deck. But because we knew everyone was going to be in this situation, we kind of created a one, one district system for that, which I would say is a definite positive that um, we got a lot of positive feedback from our educators on that. Then moving into this school year, um, we knew that we were up for that biannual review. So we began to... Um, do that content uh, revision process, which I'll go over in a little more detail here, um, that involved a lot of different feedback from different stakeholders that led us to the updates and revisions that um, we're presenting this evening. Next slide. So the next couple slides are just going to ground us in kind of what we mean when we talk about CSE. So um, CSE is, specific to sexual health, but um, this, this in itself is, is a broad area, but it is a specific area in that more comprehensive health education, right? So we have these um, health standards in Oregon and then sexuality education standards address in that the sexual health is a, is a lifelong process, process that's linked to basic human needs of things like relationship building, and receiving and um, displaying affection and um, sharing our feelings and thoughts. So the, the first package here of bulleted items are, are things that are part of CSE, but also is learning that you find in comprehensive health education and other aspects of where we teach that. So in elementary school, that might be through morning meetings, might be through their content learning time. In secondary level, that might be in advisories or their other health instructional time. So these are things like talking about body image, media literacy, decision-making, gender roles, healthy relationships and communication. Then we have our grouping of topics that generally are pretty um, <laughs> specific just to our CSE units, right? And so these are often topics that have to do with sexual and reproductive health issues. So um, things like sexual and reproductive anatomy and physiology, the administration, uh, reproduction, modern contraception, and sexually transmitted infections. Next slide. So we use this umbrella because it was the human sexuality law in 2019 that um, spun that original OAR that I addressed at the beginning of this. So that is when that OAR came was the result of this legislation. And that is what mandates that we have um, an adoption specific TS CSE and have this uh, biennial update. And so we have all these topics that kind of fit under this umbrella, but then also since 2009, we've had other legislation that we've needed to respond to as a result. And so this includes things like the Healthy Teen Relationship Act, which addresses dating and domestic violence prevention in our um, lessons that we include in our middle school and high schools. It also is Aaron's Law which um, addresses child abuse prevention K through 12. And then most recently, which I'll highlight in more detail a little bit later, is the Menstrual Dignity Act, which was signed by our governor last spring. Next slide. <clears throat> so there's comprehensive health and social emotional wellness. And, and there is a lot of um, connection between these two, which then of course overlaps into our discussion within a topic within comprehensive health, which is that sexual health. 
I think just what to highlight in the takeaway from this slide is that there are nine different topic areas when we're talking about comprehensive health education, and sexual health is just one area of this, right? So again, I think grounding back to that there's things that live just in comprehensive sexual health promotion, and then there's a lot of these topics that have constant overlap with each other. So there's some things that you can isolate just that one area, but then when we're talking about the social emotional wellness of our students, we're talking about these being skill building things that exist in all of these areas in order to break, uh, create healthy, healthy people in our school. Next slide. So our outcomes then for CSE and what research supports with CSE instruction is that it prevents sexual violence, it delays sexual initiation, it reduces the rates of sexual activity, it reduces sexual risk behaviors, it reduces sexually transmitted infections, it reduces unintended pregnancies, it reduces anxiety, depression, and suicide, and then connecting back what I just mentioned, it also is about having lifelong skills to thrive. Next slide. So that process, that revision process that I mentioned, I'd be going a little more into detail with. So um, first is that we establish the process um, for the for the board and our staff for what it is that we need to do. So we came in 2019, got that initial um, aspect um, CSC instructional plan approved by the school board. And then since then, um, we start those feedback loops and we start that constant um, improvement cycle that we go through as educators. So we look at, you know, what is it that's going to be reviewed? Who leads this work and who gives that input? Um, then we, we have our content revision team, which um, we re that team reviewed the feedback from all of our stakeholders, which I'll get into a little bit more. And then that brings us to the biannual review and update report. Next slide. So the process um, of the content revision team consisted of a cross-section of our staff members in the district. So this included um, educators and counselors at the elementary level, the middle school level, the high school level. Um, and uh, as well as district level employees as well. They began to review the feedback that's been received um, from our different stakeholders, which includes staff, students, families, and community partners over the last few years. Um, we also reviewed the updates from our publishers of the adopted curriculum and resources from that original plan. Um, the other thing that came out of the last two years in the, the constant um, change of how we respond to the pandemic has been Publishers have been making a lot of updates to their curriculum as we go through. Um, we also conducted a gap analysis of the health standards and our current lessons that we adopted in 2019. Um, and then we researched, collected, and reviewed available curriculum that could meet those gaps. So basically two areas stood out in particular for those gaps. The first was um, that we needed better resources um, for our students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we needed a curriculum that better addressed um, that population of students. And then also um, students who access our curriculum asynchronously. So initially that was just HOA, but we've learned that there's a lot of times there are reasons why we might need to make sure we have asynchronous curricula. And so um, those were two areas that we addressed um, in our gap analysis. And then um, after going through that process, we realized that we didn't want to make any other um, drastic or significant updates because what we have learned is that the Department of Education is actually beginning their review process for updating the standards for health education. So we um, predict those to come within the next couple of years, which will then really lead to likely a curriculum um, re-adoption process or re you know, more lengthy review process as we address the new standards. So then we began the work of uh, writing the detailed lesson plan summaries. And um, also the other thing that came out of the pandemic is that our, our classrooms um, moved to people's living rooms, to people's kitchens, to, to people's bedrooms, right? To like, wherever the student could find their space to do their learning. And that sometimes that meant other family members were there, which meant the conversation sometimes continued into, um, into family discussion. And so we also realized that um, including, um, you know, some conversation starters and follow-up prompts for families to use was really helpful during this time. Next slide. 
So we have summarized in five major bullet points what the major updates and revisions are from the approved 2019 plan. And you will see that the majority of these are going to be at our upper level. We did very few, if any, changes to our K through six plan. Um, again, some of that has to do with, um, we were happy with those materials and some of it has to do with, we know that new standards are coming. And that um, once we get those new standards, that will likely result in a, a, a deeper dig into our materials. So the first one is we updated some lessons at that height at the high school level in particular for medical and linguistic accuracy. Again, if we go back to the um, the OAR, one of the reasons for this biennial review is um, in accordance with new scientific information and effective educational strategies. And so that's really what that is addressing is we're bringing in some lessons from already approved um, three R's curriculum, which is rights, respect, and responsibility that better address the medical and linguistic accuracy. Uh, second there is new lessons for duplicate lessons at the high school level. When we started to implement the Aaron's Law lessons at the high school level, specifically grades 10, 11, and 12, that first year we used the same lesson for all grades because the students hadn't received any of them. But as those 10th graders became 11th graders, they needed a new lesson. And then as it became a 12th graders, we needed yet another lesson. So we've had to create some additional lessons for those duplicates. Um, we also, as I addressed earlier, we found that gap that existed for curriculum that best supports our students for intellectual and developmental disabilities. Overall in Hillsborough School District, this is about 40 students um, at the high school level that we are talking about. And so this um, curriculum is designed specifically um, for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then finally, the publisher updates. So we looked at the publisher updates um, from the curriculum that was already approved in 2019. We vetted those updates by teachers. Um, and also, we always make any of our instructional materials available to families to review prior to the instruction that happens in the classroom. And then the last one, I said I would come back to this, um, is we had updated legislation that uh, made us review our CSE um, instructional plan and see if we were addressing this um, as the legislation indicates we should. And that is the Menstrual Dignity Act. Um, governor signed it in the spring of 2021 and then the OARs just passed. So this is very fresh. Um, so March, 2022, this will impact primarily our four through 12th graders. So next slide digs a little more into that. So first and foremost, um, we part of the Menstrual Dignity Act um, addresses the need to install free menstrual product dispensers in restrooms in all of our schools. And so we approached this in a phased approach. So um, like I said, this is brand new legislation. And so ODE has been releasing guidance and toolkits for um, public educators um, throughout the, the, the school year, and they still are releasing it. So we are doing this as it's coming out. So in phase one, um, we installed two dispensers in our K-6 schools. This included an upper grade female restroom as well as an all user restroom and about half of the restrooms in our middle schools and high schools. And this included dispensers in all of our female restrooms and products available in at least one all user restroom in our middle schools and high schools. Looking into next year, then phase two is the goal is that every restroom at the appropriate grade levels will have dispenser uh, free free product dispensers in their restrooms. And so we are seeking some clarification from ODE on those primary grades because um, that that is just information that again is being released as this legislation gets uh, better interpreted as to is this really every single restroom um, or or our primary grades or something we're looking at differently. Um, the, the other um, aspect of this is the lessons and the instruction. So I think going back to what, when I was talking about CSE earlier, is that there are lessons and instruction um, connected to the Menstrual Dignity Act that are part of the CSE units, but then also are part of our just general health education that happens in other aspects of our learning. So for instance, uh, maybe when you're talking about uh, menstruation connected to anatomy and reproductive health, that might live really specifically in a CSE unit. But if you're doing a lesson with fifth graders about 
these are the dispensers that you see in the restroom and these are what they're for. And this is why you're there. That doesn't have to happen necessarily in the CSE unit, right? That can happen in other times and during classrooms. So in fact, we probably wouldn't want to wait until um, springtime to have that conversation and that lesson with students. We probably want to do that early on in the school year. And then finally, there are four pillars that the Menstrual Dignity Act calls out. Um, first is privacy. So um, it's about providing safe and private spaces for students to access and dispose of menstrual products. Inclusivity. So it's being culturally responsive and gender affirming for our students. Access, making sure that um, the products and information is accessible, but also accessibility to people of all abilities and all linguistic backgrounds. So making sure that it's in uh, people's preferred languages that they're accessing this. And then finally, the educational aspect so that it's positive, it's not fear-based, and it's not shame-based. I think the thing to keep in mind of why this legislation came and why it exists is that still in 2022, we have students that are missing school days, that are missing educational opportunities because of menstruation. And really, this is about making sure that our students have mm -hmm. access to daily instruction and that menstruation is not a barrier to that. Next slide. So as we have over the last um, few years and then moving forward, we always value our feedback loops in order to make sure that we um, are, are doing updates and revisions that are inclusive to many voices. So first and foremost, we do an annual survey to all of our administrators and educators who implement these lessons. Um, and these are simple things of, you know, what did you hear from students? What did you hear from teachers? What did you hear from families, right? So this gives us information so that we can start to pull out themes from our 36 schools across our system. We also um, have monthly meetings with our secondary health teachers. So these are all of our middle school and high school health teachers um, that where we talk about um, all of our health lessons, but including also CSE. Um, curriculum training sessions. Many of our curriculum requires us to do training with our teachers as part of our contract and agreement with them. And we are now getting to the point that teachers are accessing their round two of <coughs> training because you have to like re-up your training every couple of years. And um, that has been a really valuable space to get feedback from educators about um, the implementation of this curriculum in the classroom and how it's going and um, what maybe we could make improvements on. We also do our an annual notification to families. So whenever we teach um, CSE lessons in the classroom, we always notify families ahead of time. And in that letter, we provide the opportunity for families to review the curriculum prior to their students learning in the classroom which has then created our CSE kiosks that we have at each school. We've worked with the office staffs of all of our schools to have um, kiosks available um, with a district computer and login so that um, families can review the curriculum for CSE because much of that curriculum is copyright protected, so we can't just put it up on our website. Um, so we create these um, spaces for families to be able to review it. And then finally, we do have an open comment box for not just um, staff and families, but really anybody in our community to, to provide feedback on our, our CSE um, instruction. Next slide. So um, what is our process for being able to review the updates and revisions? So the 2019 approved open um, source lessons have been on our HSD CSE um, website and will continue to be. Like I said, when it comes to K-6, most of that is staying the same, right? So that's where you can access most of it. Um, the 2022 revisions and update lessons are available to be reviewed at the CSE kiosks at the school. So like I said, much of that is copyright protected. And so we can't just make it open for anyone and everyone to see because that would be in violation of our agreements with the curriculum and publishing companies. Um, the, after the meeting this evening, I will be following up with our school board members because um, of being having access to our internal uh, curriculum and having an HSD login. You all will have access directly to the folder that I'll be able to share with you so that you all can see it without going to a school CSE kiosk site. But um, general community members that would be able to access it that way. And then next slide, I think, is our wrap up here. So again, as mentioned at the beginning, um, the, the goals of all of this information and presentation today was to so that you as board members understood the process over the last few years to do the updates and revisions. Um, you'll understand what those updates are. 
And then finally, confirm that we have done the um, reviews and updates and are in fact in compliance with the legislation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for the phase one implementation of the Menstrual Dignity Act, it says at least one dispenser in upper grade female restrooms. The grade school is that considered four through six based on the previous slide, or when you keep your upper? It is somewhat school dependent, right? Because it, not every school is exactly the same and who they serve. So I would say a generalization would be yes, four through six. It might be three through six in some buildings. I think it just depends on kind of how the configuration of the building is. But yeah, that would be about accurate. Yeah. One question. Well, it's not really a question. Um, but I think that like. Um, so we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. They can't. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think like um, this is a topic that like is really important to me, so I feel like I, I should speak on it. It's something that well, because um, so last week like we had um, it's kind of unrelated, but it is kind of touches a little bit on it. Um, like and we, at our school, we had like walk out of um, like reproductive rights and stuff like that. We were talking, and I've had a lot of conversations with like my peers and like um, and it, it's these are our conversations that I've been having for the last six years. Um, this isn't just starting last week or anything. Um, like sex education matters a lot to our generation, um, especially when we're a generation that is like brought up by the internet. Um, like, I think that, um, like, this is a topic that really matters to a lot of kids, that a lot of kids want, wish there was more of, wish that was less uncomfortable, and they wish that, like, and so I'm really glad to see that, like, um, like, because it's a conversation that is constantly changing and evolving. Sex education is complicated. It's messy. It's uncomfortable but i think that it's it's great to see that like for example like there's update it's there's updating like for example like the national dignity act like when that passed like i didn't even know that it passed but like seeing those dispensers at those schools and then like having these conversations with my peers and then like oh this is the thing like um i feel like you know you know that for example like that addresses issues like you know period poverty which you know disproportionately affects like people of color and then um so I think that it's like, for me, like, that's really good to hear. Um, and that show makes me like really happy to hear, um, especially since like, I know that it's for some people, like, it's hard to talk about it. And I think that it's hard to have a nuanced view on it. It's hard to, um, you know, especially since it is a field that's constantly changing, it's hard to understand these things sometimes. But I think it's great that, like, at our school level, like, we're updating it, we're changing it, and we're we're making it better. Um, and then also, like, um, I like, for example, like how like they're including more like those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, you know, I would also like to add on to that, like, we should be having lessons that aren't just for those students with intellectual and disabilities, but those without, and so how they can interact with those that do, um, because. Yeah, um, just because, like, I feel like so many times they forgot those with disabilities. And I feel like um, I, I was like, yeah, it's really good that we're there included. Um, because I feel like in my education, in sex education, I feel like that was a gap that was missing. But, like, most people here know some, some disability at some point, and um, we can't ignore it. Um, so, yeah. And then, so, like, I think, like, just my feedback regarding it um, was first that I think when we have these lessons, like maybe have like both a male and a female for like I know that's hard to have someone like non-binary because we might not have that like staffing like there. Um, but having those both to like present in the room so that like when we, we have these uncomfortable conversations that like for example sometimes for me like it'd be uncomfortable to just have like a man be explaining some of these things to me just because of my experiences or like vice versa. Um, and then also like um, teaching them in a way where it doesn't feel like we're just hitting 
I think that so far we've been a good job making it a little bit better. But how do we teach these things so it doesn't feel like we're just checking a box? This is the conversation that we want to have, even if it wasn't a requirement, because it matters. Uh, and then also um, a, a framework that's even more flexible to change into transformation. Um, and then there, we've been doing a good job right now where it's open ended, where it's open to flexibility and changes, um, but continuing that and strengthening that. Um, also, like I think there was an absence of around the conference two topics that I felt like were absent in this miscarriages and responding to trauma. Um, I'm not going to share who, but someone who I'm extremely close with, they two out of five of their pregnancies resulted in miscarriage. Miscarriages happen 10, 10 to twenty percent of pregnancies, and they're they're more common than people like to admit. And I feel like when we don't talk about it, when they happen, it feels like I've never experienced it. Uh, but I think that it's important to talk about. Um, and then also like you know, responding to trauma um, and how do you then cope with that? How do you help those that have also experienced it? Um, and then like um, to kind of like and on it like I was talking to my mother the other day about this. Um, she you know it's. Uh, raised in you know China in the 80s, um, and it was very different, like from compared to like Portland in you know 2022. And she was talking about like how she was saying, "Wow, I wish that I had these conversations when I was a kid. Wow, this is this would have changed my life. Wow, I wish that." This wasn't uncomfortable. I wish that more people talked about this because this is something that affects, like, and like, I, I just think that's a good thing. I, I guess I'm saying that because I'm like, this is a really good thing. Um, so, yeah. Monique, you have a question? Yes, good evening, everyone. I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, Regarding the um, annual notification, when does that happen? Is that at the beginning of the year, at some point during the year? I, I, it's pretty consistent that we target about two to three weeks prior to the lesson because we want to make it close enough to the lesson that it's uh, timely, but also we want to allow enough time so that families can come in and review the materials if they want to. And does that vary from school to school then? Yeah, yeah. Each school sends out the letter individually. It's not a district letter. Okay. And then um, regards to the CSE kiosk and the open comment box, box, how is that communicated to families? Is that also in the letter? Yes, the, the letter does. I don't know if it mentions specifically that there you know, is a kiosk available, but it does mention in the letter that um, they have parents have the rights to, to review the materials and that they would make, they would contact their teacher first and then they would connect with their teacher about the um, availability to be able to review those materials. So I think what we found is that um, families are most connected directly with their, their classroom teacher, right? And so we like the conversation and relationship to start there first because I think what we found is that oftentimes a conversation with the teacher um, answers a lot of the questions that the families have. Um, but if not, the CSC kiosks are there as that next step if they want to dig a little deeper. Okay. And then you mentioned also about the feedback um, loop that you have for CSC. Um, so how, how does that happen? Is that solicited from certain families? Is that random or does it go out to all families? What is there a particular part that you're asking about in in specific? Just for the, just, just wanting to understand how the feedback is working with regards to to parents and in, in families communicating. Yay, I love this, or I don't like this part, or or how are you, what what feedback and how is that happening? So I would say that generally is spurred as a result of those initial letters that go out, but then also. Um, in addition, I was mentioning some of those take-home conversation starters and prompts that are extensions of those lessons. So sometimes that can prompt some of that feedback from families as well to the teacher. 
um, for input of how those conversations have gone. Um, but I think you're consistent to other feedback loops with all of the curriculum that we that we provide our our students in the classroom. Okay. All right. Thank you. I might have missed part of that. I, it's difficult to hear some some speakers sometimes. So thank you. Any other questions? Oh. I just want to add two last thoughts really quickly. I'll try to keep myself brief because I know that we've already gone super over time today, but um, I want to talk about this because it's also very, very important to me. Uh, I think that we kind of do a disservice to ourselves when we continue to stress over and over and over again that these are our legal obligations because we don't just do it for the students in our district because it's a legal obligation that we have to meet. We do it for students in our district because we want them to have the best possible life outcomes. And this type of CSE curriculum is linked to data that shows that this improves people's lives. It saves lives, whether it be through reducing anxiety, depression, and risk of suicide, or risk of risky sexual activity, but also just teaches kids valuable life skills. And I think that that can kind of get lost in the discussion of like, trying to meet all this. So I wanted to take the time to recognize it. That this curriculum is really, really important. And we've done, as far as we can tell, a really a pretty good job of implementing it with our incredibly rough new years. Interestingly enough, all of the student rough class was taking help when we got interrupted by COVID. So we actually all got to sit through first year implementation distance learning CSC. And I remember the day when I was doing some of the lessons at my house and I saw one of the health lessons that was just about healthy relationships. Um, and the names of some of the exam problems had either two traditionally female names or two traditionally male names. And as a queer student, that like, I came out of my room and told my mom about it because that meant the world to me. It showed me that like, this is a system that acknowledges that people like me are normal, that is a part of everyday life. And that's something I hope that every student can have, not just our queer students, our students of color, like you're asking for today. Our students with disabilities. Um, I'm happy with the progress that's already been made. I want more progress in those areas, and I think we're making steps towards it. I also think that uh, Director Ward brought up something in the questions that, like, I have been talking about since the start of the year. I will continue to talk about probably after I'm done being a student representative, which is communication, communication, communication. How are we telling families about this? I think that for some families who might have concerns or curiosity about CSRE curriculum, especially considering it's still pretty new within the past couple of years, plus being in the district, adding that information about the kiosk to letters in the upcoming year might be a good idea, just to make it explicitly clear. Of, you can talk to your classroom teacher and also they might send you to this resource. This is like an aside, it might help people feel a little more comfortable, but I want to thank you for coming today and all thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lightning round. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, your situation page indicates uh, that we're going to discuss downstairs the compensation for executive management, administrative, and confidential. All the information is in there. You've had a chance to review it. Uh, we will have a chance to discuss it and make a motion regarding it downstairs. So that's that one. Uh, Adam sort of touched on the contract review board we're going to have downstairs. And we had two bids. So we'll uh, be voting on that downstairs as well. If you have more questions then. All right. Okay. Uh, the schedule of board meetings means Tuesdays. Uh, only <laughs> one in June, only one in March, only one in November, one in December. Does anybody have a problem with any of the calendar possibilities that were listed in the packet on page seven? All right. Uh, last one for up here then. The candidate review questions for um, the vacancy that we're going to have to appoint. I believe Rose got some feedback and incorporated those into questions you have in front of you. Lisa, you have a question about the question. On uh, number three, um, I'm assuming that we're going to really get after commitment two, that doesn't make sense. And then uh, question six, no, eight is a question mark. The end. <laughs> so, okay. Got the, it. Rose, she got it. Yeah, okay. the, the question should be sent. Yeah, of course. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, think all the, I think all, all the people who had suggestions got their suggestions incorporated, I think. Eric, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. I, I would say we, I think we wanted to limit it to five questions. Is that correct? 
did. Sure. Sure. Five, well, I think five or six was fine. And yeah, okay. It's, if it's five, that's fine. So for merging two and four, I think I could take out the question two and use the question four that's highlighted. Yeah. yeah. That good with everybody? Sure. Um, we'll clean up number three. Um, and number six was a supplemental question. The suggestion was to move it to the, to the core. And then you see number eight there. That was also a supplemental question. And the suggestion was to move it up. If we move all, if we move those up and make the correction, I believe that gives us six questions. Okay. That's one for the board members. That's probably fine. Okay. Is everybody okay with the suggestions I just made? All right, so we'll republish those maybe in a four updates or uh, economical version that we need to, and then we'll do that next meeting, right? Yeah. All right. Lightning round over. All right. Uh, uh, we are adjourned up here. We will see you downstairs in our regular meeting in let's call it five six, seven eleven. I call this meeting of the Hillsborough School Board to order. We will begin tonight as we always do with our flag salute. For those who don't know, the flag is back there in the corner. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. As we gather here today, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge our district service area is on the occupied traditional homelands of the Atfalidi Indigenous people, lands we now call Washington County in the state of Oregon. We honor the Indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Malala, Bands of the Chinook, and other Indigenous nations of the Columbia River. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy their lives, their ancestors. We also recognize the urban, indigenous, native First Peoples communities living in the metro area, which includes over 400 tribal nations. The Hillsborough School District is committed to the recognition and education regarding tribal and local history and working with our local tribes in partnership. All right. As is often the case, we will start with some proclamations and recognitions and I get to do one. So I'm going to go over there, I think. Should I go over there? Is it got a microphone over there? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Probably not. All School District celebrates the first presidential proclamation which recognizes the transgender day of disability and disrespect of life in March of 2021. The local school district recognizes that the struggle for dignity and equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning LGBTQ people, and the charitable dedication of advocates and allies to the tribe of the local school district understands that. Including those who live in our community, simply for being who they are and who they are. And there will be much work to do to extend the promise to our country to every person. The local school district commemorates the landmark Supreme Court decision of 2015 guaranteeing marriage equality in all 50 states with historic victory for Americans and continues to affirm our belief that we are war free when we are treated as equal. The local school district celebrates that the month of June is nationally recognized as the month of celebrate contribution of the LGBTQ community by the history, the board of education of the local school district hereby proclaim the month of June 2023. We, LGBTQ Pride Month, we are to all community members of the board to recognize the many prosperity of the community of the local school district and prosperity of the society. So, on to recognition of the We have a couple tonight. So we can see Mark, I'm yeah. not minding if you're using that microphone. I think there's an issue with our microphone system. If you're going to type your speed, we'll have a lot of video. All right. I'm going to do this for now. <laughs> we have one. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, I read this one over here because I would like to. Seth, Haley, and Michelle, because the board recognizes the value of students on matters that are important to them, the board members establish the position of student representatives and board of directors in the 2018 19 school year. Last June, you were appointed to represent Glencoe and Hillsborough High Schools as student representatives and board of directors in the Hillsborough School District. Throughout the past year, you have invested countless hours studying <laughs> board materials, preparing to discuss agenda items, speaking to the interests of students, not only for board meetings, but in advocating for legislation for adequate and stable schools. All while participating in countless other activities. You have served as the liaisons, maintaining an open challenge for communication board members and students. Seth, Kaylee, and Michelle, your terms of service for the next month. I will take this opportunity to thank you sincerely for your dedication and valuable service. And we wish you the best as you complete your high school education and move forward in your future endeavors. Please take that. Please graduate. Appreciation for your service to the Oakland School District. That's okay. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you guys for everything you've done. Um, I was one of the board members who had to get it very heavily. I think we're still working on it. Uh, I hope you guys have become a cohort. Uh, we just have to know each other. Beyond the graduation stage, um, anyone can probably be the picture on who we study. We'll find out. Yeah. If there's going to be some debate over who wants to end your graduation stage, thank you guys very much for your if you're closer to her if you come over here now so right, what? we can also try this mic yeah. because this one might Yeah. Does the cord reach from the student reps? Uh, probably not. No. Because oh. <laughs> I saw an effort. <laughs> no, we can't. No, we can't. <laughs> 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 we'll pretend like it's not happening. It'll be fun. We're all going to say nice things, and you're going to cry, and I'm going to cry. It's going to be the whole thing. There's no skipping this. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Right. yeah. Monique, is this better? All right. <laughs> On March 15, 2022, Director Yadir Martinez announced her resignation from the Hillsborough School District Board of Directors. Effective at the conclusion of tonight's board meeting, Director Martinez, uh, effective conclusion, Director Martinez was initially appointed to the board in 2018 and was reelected to serve a second term in 2019. Yadira served on the Health Sciences Science Industry Advisory Team. Her passion for connecting students to healthcare opportunities has been invaluable. She is a champion for our vision of career and college pathway, pathways, especially in healthcare. Yadira's leadership, advocacy, voice, and collaboration in the rebranding of the Oak Street campus helped to bring the concept of the Pathways Center to life over the past three years. Her connections to the Hillsborough community brought diverse perspectives and people to the table. Her support of alternative options for multiple pathways to graduation was invaluable and has impacted the lives of thousands of Hillsborough students and families. In addition to serving on the board of directors and various district committees, Director Martinez has also volunteered countless hours of her time in schools, 
working with students and modeling a passion for alternative education and ongoing learning. We truly appreciate the years of leadership <laughs> and service that Director Martinez has contributed to the Hillsborough School District, and we wish her, wish her success in all of her future endeavors, one of which we will nominate her for later this evening. Um, so that's like the dry part. Uh, Mike, you want to? Yeah, uh, we did want the opportunity to share some thoughts, and I just want to be over here so I can see you and not be looking past you. Um, as we all know, this is Yadira's last meeting, First and uh, we want to ex extend our sincere appreciation. I'm going to start by making a few comments, and then we're going to open it up to the board members uh, so they can make some comments as well. So uh, buckle up, Yadira. Um, so aggressive, careless, un <laughs> Dramatic, this is the wrong one. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with this one instead. Okay. Um, Yadir is one of the busiest people that I know. Uh, she has more than a full-time job and she is constantly involved in professional development to um, advance her career. Um, along with that, she, um, her family is super important to her. And, um, and she spends a lot of time prioritizing her family's needs and making sure that they have everything that they need to be successful. I think when I think of Yadira, I think she understands grit and resilience and she brings that grit and resilience um, to her work as a board member. And she brings that grit and resilience uh, to her advocacy for the students of Hillsboro. Uh, Yadira served on the board because she knew that it would make a difference for kids. And as you have made a difference for kids and the Hillsborough community, You've done so without wanting anything back in return. Uh, you didn't join the board with an agenda in mind. You joined it purely to make a difference for kids and to provide a service. Um, it's never been about personal gain for you and you've, you've come onto the board and just uh, given in a really unique way. I wanna thank you for your vision and for your voice and to help shape a better learning environment for our students. Um, you're incredibly respectful and thoughtful you bring a you've brought a context to the board work that uh, we didn't have before. Uh, you've been instrumental in the work to open the Pathway Center and to transition the Miller Education Center to the Oak Street campus. Um, so happy to have had the opportunity to work alongside, with, uh, alongside you and to learn from you. And I wanna thank you for the countless hours that you've donated. We've appreciated your many contributions and the difference that you've made. I know that board members don't have favorite schools, but if they did, yours probably would be Pointer, Glencoe, and Oak Street, where you went, um, as well as McKinney and Evergreen. So we have a basket of goodies for you. It looks like we might have swiped a PE basket. <laughs> <laughs> sure what that there we go. And in there, you'll also find the traditional engraved bell that we give our board members as a thank you when they have completed their service. So thank you very much for everything that you contributed to our students. Uh, you've made a difference in a really unique way and we've appreciated all that you've done. Other board members want to chime in? Do other board members have anything you'd like to add? Oh, all right. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, I think You've been extremely thoughtful, kind, and just an amazing person on the board. Um, and I think, like, especially, like, as a student rep, like, you've been someone, like, I want to be, like, Yudira, and I want to, like, and I think, like, you know, we haven't talked a lot, um, but I think that, you know, I will miss you, uh, even though, like, I'll only go to one more board meeting, too, but, um, like, thank you for your service, and thanks for always being super thoughtful, um, and yeah, I hope that like, I don't know how to say this. I'm not really good at like talking, but um, <laughs> yeah, <neither. laughs> um I just, I just, just thank you. I think I'll go before I lose my nerve right now because this is really hard. This is really hard. Can you hear me better? Okay. I just want to thank Yadira. I think everything that Mike said really encompasses who she is as a person, but also just her quiet strength that everybody knows. It is going to be my goal that Yadira is going to come back later in life because she's, she's a Hillsborough community member for life. 
So I know that she's going to be here for a long time. Um, and just all the gifts that you've given to our community. I'm so thankful that I got to serve with you. I, um, I want to publicly acknowledge Yadira. Uh, I didn't have the, the privilege of working with her uh, as long as she is, as, as you know, myself and, you, and Monique just came on the board last year. And I just want to say there is a, there is a power in silence sometimes. There is a power when knowing when it's time to be quiet. And then there's a time, there's a power in knowing when to speak up. Um, sometimes and throughout my life, I've gotten it confused, but I always had the feeling that Yadira never got it confused. So I need you to know that I never said that to you, but don't lose your voice. It is very, very powerful. Even when you are silent, don't lose that. There's much to be said, much work to be done. And it has been my pleasure to work with you for this past year. And I look forward to seeing more of what else you're going to be doing. And hopefully I can nerd out with you sometime and see what else is going on. But I know that we didn't have all of the years together, but um, do not think for one moment that you have not been inspirational, powerful, and um, a presence very much felt. So thank you. Okay. I've had to say goodbye to board members who uh, leave a little early a couple of other times. Um, and it is never easy, but I think that this might be the hardest time. Um, I, I don't know if I can put into words, which is, uh, says a lot because I'm an English teacher. Um, what your friendship has meant to me um, or how to describe the lessons that you have taught me that have made me a better person and a better board member. I also, uh, there, there's something about going through a campaign with another person on the same team that uh, is, is probably like going uh, through boot camp. Uh, and, and I really appreciate that I got to do that with you a few years ago. And I am sad that we won't get to do that again, but only a little. Um, but there's, there's, there's no way to replace um, the void or fill the void that you are going to leave for our community and our students and our board. Um, the determined and steadfast advocacy for meeting all students where they are at and giving them a path to be successful um, is something that I admire so much. And it is a torch that I will try and carry forward in the time that I have left on the board um, while I still sit here. Um, I, I, I don't know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm rambly, I'm, I apologize. Um, Yadira, you are, you are an incredible person. Uh, you are a kind and selfless and compassionate person. You are a very strong person. And one of the things that I admire most about you is that um, people know, as, as you maybe could infer, when you speak, it's worth listening to. Um, and that's one of the most important lessons that you have taught. And I'm going to miss you so much. And I'll stop talking now. Did you guys turn your light back on? Okay. All right. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for everything you do, not only on the board, but to our community. And um, I know that I didn't get very close to you in my short time um, knowing you, but I wanted to thank you because when I walked in here, um, I remember seeing you and Erica, and you guys look like me. And um, it made me feel very comfortable and like I was represented by such amazing people. And I, I just wanted to thank you for 
for being here and um, representing our community and being somebody that I really looked up to because every time you spoke, I felt like you spoke for me and for my community as well. So just thank you for for being here and for taking time um, to advocate for our students. Um, I'll just wrap this up by saying, I am a firm believer in civic involvement, but I'm also a very firm believer in like, just knowing when something's too much. Um, and I want to say that it also like means something to see somebody understand that they have a position in which they've done a lot of good, but knowing they need to put their own oxygen mask on before trying to help somebody else. And that I really, really respect that. And I think that just by doing that, you set a good role model for people in addition to, you know, everything everybody else has said today, um, knowing how to take care of yourself. And I hope that you know that nobody is upset at you. Everybody is just incredibly thankful for the, all that you did for us in the past. And we know that you're going to continue to be an incredibly important member of this community. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to talk as much while I was on the board and as a student representative. Uh, but every time you talked, like everybody else said, I knew that you had something really, really important to say. And that's something that I've tried to learn from. So thank you for all of your service. Monique, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, um, as uh, Director Thomas had said, we didn't really get a chance to work too much with you directly, Yadira. We, we had this almost year together. Um, I wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. Uh, I said this, I think last meeting, we had, I think, four tremendous candidates that we interviewed. And I, I remember leaving the house, saying to Jenny, like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. Oh, uh, sorry. And we had just, uh, 2018, some of us had just come off campaign and we had these, you know, figuring out how to talk about issues and whatever. And during the interview process, what was amazing was the way Yadira s spoke from the heart about all the issues we cared about without the campaign speak. It was amazing. It was just clear. Oh, and I guess thank you for that too. Like making it so obvious what the choice was because I was, not sure who, which direction I was going to go when I left the door. Um, and for those of you who haven't looked ahead in the agenda, I mean, this isn't uh, like a goodbye because later in the in the meeting, we will be appointing Yadira to fill the vacancy at, on the board of the Northwest Regional ESD. So um, the public service does continue. <laughs> um, so thank you for taking on that role. Um, and, you know, it was so great to get to know you outside the boardroom. You dear is brilliant and funny and caring and everything you want a public servant. So thanks. Do you have anything you want to add? Um Wait for us. I'm just so proud to be a part of this district. I don't know if how many people know. I grew up in this district since kindergarten, all the way through. I have two sons that have graduated from this district, so it's close to my heart. And the work I did here is so that all students can have a great experience. And it's so great to see just the changes that have been made in my short time here, the growth of the CCP program, putting equity to the forefront of everything we do here so that every student feels included, safe, and um, feels like they belong in our district has been incredible. And I mean, Mike, you and your staff, the teachers here, I mean, we're in an awesome place. And it was so good to hear when board members came back from um, San Diego saying how much we 
are ahead of the game. And that is because of all the people, the great people that we have in this district and their ideas and the way we allow them to create these special programs for our students. I mean, I'm just so proud. So um, it's been an honor to be on this board and to serve with such wonderful people. And it's not a goodbye. You guys will see me around. I'm part of this community. So, I mean, you'll see me here, there. I'll still be part of the CCP committee. And that's always something that's so exciting for me. And um, yeah, so, so you'll, you'll, you'll still be seeing me. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve our agenda? I move that the board of director approve the agenda as printed. Second. Is that you there? Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it's been moved by director Lopez and seconded by director Materias Martinez that the board approve the agenda as printed. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, do we call roll down here? Is that, yeah, I guess. Oh uh, yeah. All right. I Erica Lopez? Aye. Martinez? Aye. Nancy Thomas? Aye. Tony Ford? Aye. Mark Watson? Aye. Motion carries. The agenda is approved. Uh, before consent agenda, we do have one audience time, so I will read the statements. Public participation in board meetings is governed by policy BDDH. Visitors who wish to speak before the board must complete an intent to speak card available at the top of the HSD homepage and or at the table at the entrance of the boardroom and submit it via the Google form by email or in person to the executive assistant of the board of directors, Rose Roman. Commenters should include their name and if speaking for an organization, the name of, an organiza the name of the organization. A spokesperson should be designated to represent a group with a common purpose up to three minutes at the board's discretion will be allowed per comment. Commenters may offer objective criticism of district operations and programs, but in public session, the board will not hear comments regarding any individual staff member. Commendations involving, sta and involving staff members should be sent to the superintendent. Channels for the board's review of legitimate complaints involving individuals include board policy KL, public complaints. If appropriate, the board chair will connect the visitor with an administrator to receive comments regarding personnel. Any hearing conducted before the board regarding personnel shall take place in an executive session. Comments aimed at state and federally protected classes shall be prohibited. Anger, rudeness, ridicule, obscene or profane language, impatience, lack of respect for others, and personal attacks are not acceptable. Demonstrations in support or opposition of a speaker are not permitted. The board thanks all visitors for their presence and appreciates the input of community members. We have one. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, that's going to be a thing, huh? We're out of microphones. Um, Tori Lewis here. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Right That's okay. That's okay. We'll go for that. Hey, thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, my name's Tori Lewis. There we go. Huh. My name's Tori Lewis, a proud parent of uh, my daughter who had graduated from Glencoe High School and is now attending Loma Linda Medical University, or second year. And then uh, also for my son, uh, he's a uh, second year at Oregon State because he's studying computer science. So definitely attachment to, to our school district. And thank you very much for all the work that you do. Um, I'm sure by now everyone has seen the news of uh, the shooting tragedy in Texas. Um, and uh, I wanted to offer a, a prayer um, for those who are hurt by that. So let me go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, our hearts are broken for the tragedy that we see today in Texas. Lord, we live in a sinful world, and I pray that you would just, that you would just be with those families, students and teachers, staff members, police, policemen and women. Uh, and first responders. Lord, I pray that you would just bring comfort to them during this time. And Lord, as we um, 
as that school, as uh, school leaders here today, Lord, I just pray that you would give us your mercy and your guidance as we deal with this um, atrocious sin. May we seek you in these troubling times. And we, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Any other comments, Rose? Would anybody like to move to approve the consent agenda? I move that the board of directors approve the cons consent agenda as printed. Second. It's been moved by Director Martinez and seconded by Director Thomas that the board of directors approve the consent agenda as printed. Is there any discussion? Rose, can you call the roll, please? Lisa Allen. Aye. Eric Lopez? Aye. Aye. Martinez? Aye. Nancy Thomas? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Consent agenda is approved. The first of our action items involves the Nutrition Services Department, and I see Nate is here. So thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, we're getting back into kind of normal operations for nutrition services next year as we resume uh, the free and reduced price paid meal program, uh, organ eligibility and paid meal pricing. And so uh, one of the things that happened pre-pandemic was that we looked at meal prices every year. And so now that we're going back to that, we need to, we revive, re looked at our prices and uh, so we need to increase those prices across the board uh, in accordance with the uh, tools that are in place for our department. Um, and the, the, um, the free meals that we had over the last two years were uh, an exception to our normal operations. And those are ex that waiver and uh, extension of that ends June 30th. The table's in our packet on page 36. Does anybody have any questions for Nate? I have a statement. I, uh, Nate, I know that we have to do this, but I can't help but feel like this will also impact the very students that we were trying to feed and make sure that they stayed in connection and, and fed. It just feels like we're taking a step back. I know you've done the homework. I know we have to do what we have to do, but it doesn't change the feeling that we're negatively impacting the very students that we just uplifted, that we just fed, the very families that we connected with, all of that, despite the atrociousness of COVID-19 and this global pandemic, there were some positives. And watching us feed families and feed kids, that was incredible. So I just hope we find a way to continue to feed the children. I just wanted to say that to you. <laughs> uh, I would like to agree with like Nancy. Um, I know that like it's not easy to raise prices and like we don't like to do that. Um, but I was just wondering, so like I had two questions. So the first one is, do we know what prices they are going to be next year? They're in yeah, the packet. And then uh, I was just, yeah. Um, and then I was just gonna say, so like, so I know that like for a lot of the Porsche, so are is there gonna be? I feel like this is a dumb question, but I feel like it's a lot of it's a question that a lot of high schoolers are probably thinking. Um, so if like if we're raising the prices, are is there gonna be any changes in the like the portions at all? Um, especially since like I know that especially this year. Like a lot of high schoolers and kids felt like this portions this year were smaller than they've ever been. Um, and they're just not enough. So if they're gonna be charged more for it, is it still gonna be that like little amount? Uh it's a good questions. Um, so the portion sizes are all uh regulated. So the USDA and food nutrition services, uh Dietary Guidelines for All Healthy Americans, that's what feeds into what ends up on our menu. And um, so myplate.gov is where you would go to see why our menu is what it is. 
Uh, we have calorie maximums, uh, fat maximums, uh, and lots of things that go into the meals we have. So in essence, uh, no, the portion sizes will stay the same. Um, nutrition services is, is a little bit different than the rest of the district because meal sales are, and people taking meals is how we get our revenue. And so we have to look at things like food cost and labor cost and how that changes year to year. And um, so that's what kind of goes into this. And then also we have a responsibility to those that do receive uh, meals at no cost, where we look at, um, look at people who have the ability to pay, pay their share so that we're not using the revenue that we get for those meals at no cost that might reduce the quality of our meals so that we can keep our paid prices low. So the intent is to give the best nutrition to um, those who need it uh, the most, and then uh, try and try and measure that we're we're covering our expenses at the same time. Does that kind of answer that? Lisa, you have a question? Yes, I have two questions. Um, I assume that the price that we see in our packet, Nathan, is for full price lunch? Correct. So where can I find what the reduced price lunch would be? So uh, back in 2014, the Oregon legislature approved uh, eliminating the reduced price category for Oregon students. So we still call it free and reduced, yeah, but we just really mean free. It's a federal program that's okay. now subsidized by uh, or Oregon as well. Perfect. And those um, requirements are on the school district website underneath the nutrition services. Right. Um, for anyone who is interested uh, for those income guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is in the uh, info page, the situation page, it says that um, this is necessary to meet um, paid meal equity. Can you explain that for us? Sure. The um, USDA has two tools that we have to use each year to justify our pricing and what we're charging for meals. Uh, one is the paid lunch equity uh, measurement, which is a bunch of math uh, that just goes into to make sure that we're not using, uh, like I said, that free reimbursement rate that we get for every free meal, that we're not subsidizing a lower paid price. Uh, to encourage participation for people that pay for meals. So that's that one. And then the other one is called the non-program food cost uh, eva uh, analysis, which looks at all those items that aren't meals, but to ensure that, again, we're charging a price that covers our food and, and labor expenses without subsidizing uh, a lower price for those foods uh, from basically the revenue we get for free and reduced meals. And I was going to add, I forgot to mention this, that uh, prior to the pandemic, the Oregon legislature included in the Student Success Act had um, an expansion of the income eligibility guidelines. So um, the free and reduced, the federal free and reduced program covers 186% of the federal poverty level. And then the Student Success Act included a additional range that goes up to 300% of the federal poverty level. So it's encompassing more families that might have need for those meals. And I know before the pandemic, we also had a change where we had classified some entire schools where we didn't have to differentiate student by student. Right. And yeah. so that, that remains in place where we, we can't just declare the entire school. Right. Four, 14 schools right now are eligible to offer meals at no cost to all students. And that's under the community eligibility provision. And, and before the pandemic, it was more than that, right? It was actually less. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we, we, it started in 13, we had 14 schools. Then we, that lasts for four years and we have to reevaluate. And then we went down to eight. And then That's uh, awesome. the okay. next, I think two years later, we were able to get more schools on uh, using actually with the intent of using the SSA, the Student Success Act uh, provisions, because they expanded also that um, they would ensure that 90% of meals at CEP schools are reimbursed at that free rate. And as Seth reminded us upstairs, communication, communication, communication. Uh, we know there are many students at schools not in those 14 that are eligible. So uh, we encourage you to do all the all you can communication wise to reach out to those families to make sure that they're receiving the benefit to which they're entitled. We'll do it. I do have a final question to ask. I was wondering, um, and our CFO might be able to help me. I, I had no idea that the food that we were serving was actually generating revenue. So thank you for telling me that. But any guess off the top of your head how much, I mean, percentage-wide revenue that we're actually making from the food? Just curiosity, not argument. Okay. Um, so the, 
our food service program is still a nonprofit. Yeah. Uh, so all the money that we generate goes back into the food mm-hmm. service program. And expenses that come out of that fund can only specifically be used uh, for our services that we provide to uh, the district and the community. Um, so I don't know if that answers gets to the question you're asking. It does. But... It does. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Erica? Yeah, my question was just around the communication piece because of that. Um, you know, federally, it's 186% of the poverty, but as a state, we expanded it to 300. So when we communicate this to families about the price change, is there a way that um, we can also just mention that they should check because it might be eligible because of how more extensive it has been? Yeah. So we're going to send out uh, reminder cards and the whole application packet to households that don't uh, attend CEP schools. And in the cover letter, we have a table that shows household size and annual income level. Uh, so that's the first glance that people will have is that top page where they'll see, hey, does my family of four or my family of six or my family of two or three, do, do we, are we able to get those benefits? And so that'll be included and we'll send that whole packet out to households uh, this summer. Thank you. I think that this is one of the topics that we get a lot of emails about when something changes around the food. So mm-hmm. thank you. If there are no other questions, would anybody like to make a motion? I move that the board of directors approve the increase in meal prices effective July 1st, 2022. Second. It's been moved by Director Lopez and seconded by Director Martinez that the board of directors approve the increase in meal prices effective July 1st, 2022. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Rose, can you please call the roll? Aye. 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 Nancy Thomas. Aye. Tony Ford. Aye. Tony Ford. Can you hear us? Aye. Sorry. Yeah. Mark oh. Watson. Aye. Motion carries. You don't have a microphone, Rose, for what it's worth. Oh, it <laughs> uh, yeah. Rose, Rose does not have a microphone. Uh, all right. You're up, Adam. Okay, as we discussed, <clears throat> excuse me, upstairs, uh, we have the award of the contract for the domestic water pipe replacement at McKinney Elementary School. Um, the recommendation is that we award that to Five Star Builders uh, for the bid amount of $393,792. Just one thought, uh, Chair Watson, you had asked upstairs whether or not we were comfortable with the two bids we got. We were actually pretty happy. We thought we were going to get three, but because this project came to us late. Um, we had short time to get the work to get the to get it out, and uh, we were really happy with the both the pricing and the the response that we got from the bidder. So, all right, thank you. I guess my concern was less that and more feature facing. Um, you know, is it is this a sign that fewer people are interested in working with us? No. Okay. Um, it was just the timing. Um, gotcha. A lot of contractors already had their summer mm-hmm. booked out. So okay. uh, we were very happy to get the two that we got. Does anybody have any questions for Adam? Would anybody like to make a motion? Maybe you should dear makes them all. I I move that the board of directors award the contract for the domestic water pipe replacement at McKinney Elementary School to five star builders for the bid amount of $393,792. I second. Competition. All right. Uh, it's been moved by Director Martinez and seconded by Director Allen that the Board of Directors award the contract for the domestic water pipe replacement at McKinley, McKinney Elementary School to five star builders for the amount of $393,792. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would you like to call the roll, please? Oh, from way over there. Lisa Allen? Aye. Erica Lopez? Aye. Dear Martinez. Aye. Nancy Thomas. Aye. Monique Ward. Oh. Aye. She heard that. Mark Watson. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, Adam. I don't think you're done for the day, though, huh? Not quite. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, the next item is, I guess, Mike, are you going to talk about it? Or me? Yeah, North, Northwest Regional ESD, or I could just make a motion, whatever, but. Uh, uh, we have a dance over here. What's that? We have a dance. Oh, di- oh. oh, it's for motion. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Uh, do you want to describe yeah. the situation? Already? Yeah, let me just uh, describe the situation. So as I believe everybody is aware, uh, Lisa Pollitz uh, is leaving her position as a board member for the Northwest Regional ESD. And there's a year left on that term. And so uh, when there is an opening, um, the ESD board positions are divided up into zones. And so Hillsborough, because of the size of our district, we are responsible for filling one of those zones. And that process is our own. So it, it can be as fancy or as simple as we want it to be. And um, so tonight what we'll be doing is um, electing a person. <laughs> I don't want to foreshadow the vote. Let's just say it's Yadira. Um, <laughs> it's, we'll be electing Yadira to, uh, to the board. And then the only thing left for the ESD to do would be for um, Yadira to take the oath of office at their next meeting. That's it. I move that the Board of Directors endorse Yadira Martinez to fill the remaining term for the vacancy of Northwest Regional ESD Zone 3 to begin July 1st, 2022. Second. <laughs> Based on the dibs, it has been moved by Director Lopez and seconded by Director Allen that the Board of Directors endorse Yadira Martinez to fill the remaining term for the vacancy of the Northwest Regional ESD Zone 3 to begin July 1st, 2022. Is there any further discussion? Monique? I just have a quick question. Um, just a little bit of concern. And um, Yudir, you had mentioned um, at the previous, when you made your announcement that you were stepping down, that you found it difficult to manage juggling all your board duties with, with your schooling and all the other things you were doing. So I was just wondering how this is going to work differently for you. So oh, I got to meet with the superintendent and that's one of the first things that we talked about is what is um, what is the workload for a board member for the um, ESD and the time commitments are much less than this current board. And so that is, um, I feel confident that I'll be able to commit to, to um, their, um, their time commitments there. So that, that's one of the reasons they still wanted to stay involved and this is a way that I can do that. Um, and also um, that requires less, less of my time than, than the Hillsborough board. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, Mike, a question for you, because you had, you said in the, when you um, announced this about us having a position that needed to be filled. So it needs to be filled with someone from our board or how does that process work? it needs to be filled from somebody that lives within the attendance area of the Hillsborough School District. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Rose, can you call the roll, please? Lisa Allen. Aye. Aye. Did you remark, do I vote on this? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you, you could just abstain, whatever. <laughs> Aye. Are you Opposed. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you for continuing your service to our community. Absolutely. Uh, oh, Michelle's moved over to the microphone zone. All right, <laughs> acknowledging a donation. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Chair Watson. We have our monthly report to the board um, for our donations over $5,000. Uh, I think I've mentioned before we received many, many donations directly to schools for lesser uh, amounts, and they're um, just as important. Uh, the board, I'm hoping will acknowledge tonight a donation of $7,000 from the Hillsborough Schools Foundation to Indian Hills Elementary School for the STEAM Makerspace grant. And um, just a quick shout out to Aaron Carlson back there uh, with Hillsborough Schools Foundation. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll be looking for an acknowledgement, please. I move that the Board of Directors acknowledge the donation of $7,000 from the Hillsborough Schools Foundation to Indian Hills Elementary School for the STEAM Makerspace Grant. And I second that motion. No. It's been moved by Director Allen, to Allen and seconded by Director Thomas that the Board of Directors acknowledge the donation of $7,000 from the Hillsborough Schools Foundation to Indian Hills Elementary School for the STEAM Makerspace grant. Is there any further discussion? I just want to say that the Hillsborough Foundation is 
pretty impressive. I have seen this organization kind of, I, I not been involved yet, but what I have seen and what I know has been tied to your money, your dollars, your work is absolutely incredible. Um, so thank you. And that's not even good enough, but I have to start there. So thank you on behalf of all of us parents and all of our children. Thank you. That doesn't require a second, but I would second that. <laughs> Any further discussion? Rose can call the roll, please. Lisa Allen. Aye. Erica Lopez. Aye. 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 The motion carries. All right. Uh, surplus items. That's Casey. I guess. Does your microphone work? Oh, then you gotta you go. gotta come over, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, part of um, the goal we had this year in facilities, especially with a lot of new um, great stuff that the bond has purchased, was I tasked my staff to go through all of our. I'll call them district warehouse buildings or storage buildings uh, to, determine, to determine what stuff that is obsolete, no longer useful, uh, has been deemed too costly to repair. And um, because we really need to uh, clean out some of that stuff. So what you have in your packet, um, according to policy DN, disposal of district property, which requires the board to declare these items surplus is a pretty comprehensive list of items that meet that criteria. Um, the, the process for us to dispose of that is in July, uh, we're gonna have a public auction that's available to anybody to uh, bid on these items. Um, our hope is that from that public option, we'll be able to generate um, some costs and revenue that we'll be able to actually uh, purchase new equipment for those departments that we are um, getting rid of stuff for. Um, should we not uh, be able to um, sell all of our stuff at that auction, we'll move to our next phase of uh, working with the state of Oregon Department of Administrative Services. They have disposal uh, processes that uh, fit our criteria. Um, so what I'm asking is that the board looks at this itemized uh, list, this pretty comprehensive list of items and declare surplus so we can move forward with preparing the auction and then further disposal if necessary. Happy to answer any specific questions. I had been curious why it seemed longer than lists in the past. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, the main reason is we've we've had items here and there where a mm -hmm. certain part of the district has, there's been too much um, storage space used up at such and such spot. And it's just been kind of um, segregated to that specific building or department. This, what we really did is we, I put somebody in charge of going building by building, really did a comprehensive dive in all of the stuff that is um, obsolete or unuseful to us. So that's why it's much bigger. We did do this years and years ago. That was a pretty big auction. I want to say 2012-ish. Um, and we have had them prior to that um, before. Can we legit have a 1974 Chevy pickup truck or pick shop truck still in use? Oh yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> wow. We, we, are we, we utilize them uh, till the very end. Are, are we allowed to uh, advertise this as a, a fundraising effort for the school district? Yeah, we will certainly put a lot of information out in our uh, traditional communication channels. We use a certified auctioneer uh, to also, cool. they will also be advertising so that it's professional. It'll all be online. Um, that's kind of how they're operating um, these days because of everything going on. But they will also advertise um, that as well as internally once we get the the list mm -hmm. solidified uh, mm -hmm. tonight, hopefully, mm -hmm. and then get some more details on the dates. From a and so my follow up question is from a budget perspective: Does this come back as a donation or do we get the tax credit like other non No, none of that. This is just.
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank Other you. Other questions for Casey? Seeing none, when anybody likes making. Oh. Mark, oh, Mark yeah, sorry. Could, sorry. Can you uh, can you summarize what Michelle was saying? Because I didn't hear her response to. Oh, sorry. She said that um, the amount will be tracked based on department and where the equipment came from, and they'll be given discretionary funds to use to either replace those items or choose what else they they would like to have in their stead. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Sorry about that. Ah. Oh. <laughs> I move that the board of directors declare the listed items as district surplus and authorize the disposal in accordance with district district surplus procedures. I surplus second. It's been moved by Director Lopez and seconded by Director Thomas that the board of directors declare the listed items as district surplus and authorize the disposal in accordance with district surplus procedures. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Rose, can you please call the roll? Lisa Allen? Aye. Erica Lopez? Aye. Lydia Martinez? Aye. Nancy Thomas? Aye. Mona Jones? Aye. 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 The motion carries. All right. Previewed it upstairs. Connell, would you like to talk about the contract situation? Certainly. So uh, back in May of 2021, in accordance with past practice, the board approved a three-year agreement for executive management, administrators, confidential and supervisory technical employees. And that was to align with the timelines that we have in agreements with the licensed employee groups. And so you can see the four bullets there that were approved at that time around the step that people would receive, um, the general salary inc increase and insurance increase uh, equivalent to licensed staff increases. And then in May, we were able to ratify that contract for licensed uh, for a three-year agreement from July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2024. And so the compensation proposal uh, that's uh, approved that is proposed there has to do with the salary increasements uh, through um, the 2021 to 2024 time period. And um, it also talks about the general salary increases in there that are 3% for each of the years. And then uh, also adding a step advancement uh, for folks that were already at the maximum step in alignment with what was happening for license uh, contract. And then for insurance, um, we have increased that amount uh, by $40 over the three years. And um, we are not enacting that until um, the June 2022 rate will be put in place um, to incur some savings there. And then we just wanted to make note that also Juneteenth would be a non-contract day. Um, and that if it falls within the annual work calendar, um, it won't have an impact on uh, people's uh, compensation uh, because of their annualized salary. So. Um, I would just wonder if you have any questions in regards to all of this. Any questions for Kana? Thank you for all of your hard work. This was an incredible effort. Thank you. Excellently laid out in the situation page. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, for the questions, uh, would anybody like to make a motion? I move that the board of directors approve the amended three-year agreement with executive management administrators, confidential and supervisory technical employees to align with the compensation increases that were approved for licensed staff at the completion of the bargaining process. Second. Second. It has been moved by Director Thomas and seconded by Director Martinez that the board of directors approve the amended three-year agreement with executive management, administrators, confidential and supervisory technical employees to align with the compensation increases that were approved for licensed staff at the completion of the bargaining process. Are there any further discussion? Rose, can you please call the roll? Lisa Allen. Aye. Erica Lopez. Aye. Lydia Martinez. Aye. Nancy Thomas. Aye. Tony Ford. Aye. Aye. The motion carries. All right. In accordance with uh, the rules and regulations, right? We're going. We're going. So we are going to uh, recess the school board meeting and I will convene a meeting of the local contractors review board. 
We'll be discussing the finding of fact from the exemption of competitive bidding for authorizing a specific product specification. I think since you moved over, I'm guessing you're telling us about it. Yes. Um, so we're looking at uh, update, updating the paging systems at each school uh, to standardize on one paging system. We have about five or six different paging systems across the district that are of, of a large uh, varying ages. Um, and with the bond projects wrapped around the new phone system, which will be coming in the next year, and uh, the new uh, security trio access control systems, um, we would like to tie those three systems together to su supply some ad added functionality. Um, and this is uh, the addition of the paging project to the bond uh, would be part of that um, and allowing us to tie those three systems together, which will of course work much better if they're all three the same type of systems, uh, make it much easier to tie those together and make them all work in the same with the same functionality. So uh, that's what this is all about. The uh, system that we're proposing uh, is the Rowland Telecenter uh, U system. And we have that currently at eight sites, our new buildings, uh, along with a few buildings that as we came across adding new gyms or other bond projects, uh, there was an issue with extending those old paging systems. And so at those points, we had to replace a couple of those uh, as part of those construction bond projects. So we'd like to bring all the other schools in line to that same system so we can make this uh, all work together. Any questions for Jordan? Yes, if um, upon moving forward with this, would this also be done this summer? Or, or do you anticipate another year to get all of this online? The, um, the entire it'll take a couple years, um, but the way we're doing it is, I mean, to fully replace the, the full paging systems, what we're gonna do means we're adding the phone system in the next year, we can just add the head end unit for the new paging system without replacing the rest of the component parts and make the connections we need between the three systems. Uh, that we will be able to do in the next year. Um, and then the follow-up will be at some of those sites then replacing the other pieces of the paging system to make the rest of the paging function. So my final question is, will this system also be comparable or compatible with the emergency systems that are coming along for the state using Everbridge, that type of thing, or no? Um, we should be able to type in, I'm not specifically familiar with Everbridge. I know um, I have looked at before on the early earthquake warning systems, mm -hmm. um, and that would be something we could look at um, because what it allows us to do then is submit. What this is doing is tying uh, the access control system. So if we, and uh, if we, a lockout lockdown is initiated, um, it allows us to automate the paging and some of those features, uh, same thing, allowing some more features that would allow us to trigger certain things from the phone system um, between all three systems. So. Thank you. Any other questions for Jordan? Seeing none, you do, would you like to make the longest motion of the <laughs> final motion sure. of the final meeting? I move that the board of directors acting in the capacity of the local contract review board approve the findings of fact, allowing special procurement and exemptions from competitive build, bidding for the Roland Telecenter U communication systems and services from NIS consulting when the administrative project management team believes it is the, in the best interest of the Hillsborough School District. Second. Second. All right. It has been moved by Director Martinez and seconded by Director Ward that the Board of Con Board of Directors acting in the capacity of the Local Contract Review Board approve the findings of fact allowing special procurements and exemptions from competitive bidding for the Rowland Telecenter U Communication Systems and Services from NIES Consulting and when the administrative project management team believes it is in the best interest of the Hillsborough School District. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Rose, can you call the roll, please? Aye. 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 All right, the motion carries. 
We will adjourn the local contract review board. I will reconvene the meeting of the Hillsborough School Board. All right, reports and presentations. Does anybody have any questions for Michelle regarding the financial report? Or Michelle, do you have any color you would like to add? I have just a few items of note. So thank you for your action in terms of all of our bargaining agreements and uh, wages. We are able to fit that into the current year. Our classified staff experienced their retro pay this month and uh, all licensed staff and the other staff that you approved this evening will uh, receive their retro pay and um, appropriate placement pay uh, starting in June. So thank you very much for your action on that. We also uh, just want to put a plug out there because my uh, risk manager, Leah McCarthy, is uh, leaving us in mid-June to start a new adventure. And so her position is currently posted and we have a cross-department team that will be working to fill that. And that's a fairly important one to us um, because it does have a district-wide scope. And of course, any questions you might have about the financial report or cash flow. Any questions? Oh, Erica, you have a question? I, I just wanted to give you a shout out, Michelle, on the situation page in the packet, just the amount of work that your department is doing around um, just standardizing and centralizing a lot of the processes. I remember talking about this maybe a few years ago. And so just seeing it come to fruition now and how you're doing this work around tracking, <clears throat> excuse me, our fixed assets. And just, there's a lot of work that it's very dry and maybe not as you know, career technical stuff, but what? it still goes to, <laughs> for our general public, but it still goes to the operations of our district. And it's, I just, it should be applauded just how much this takes to do this work in finance. So thank you so much. Thank you. We have a wonderful team in the office. Minus one. Minus, yeah, minus one. <laughs> yeah. Minus one. Any other questions for Michelle? I'm not looking to make a ton of work for you, but, uh, this is where we have our workers comp report and our student incident reports. It's not really financial stuff, but it's always in there. And we really have room and what and I'm not asking you to do anything today, just conceptualize or think about maybe we're comparing. The only comparison we have is 2021, which is not super accurate comparison to where we are today. Um, I don't even know that 1920 would be a good comparison. Maybe for part of it, it would be. So just, uh, we don't really have a sense of scale to tell if the increases are normal. Are we on pat track with what our incidents are for workers' comp and students when classrooms are generally full? So it's just, it, it's hard for us to visualize, you know, what the increase it's clearly increased, but like, is it a crazy amount of increase or is it like, Oh, this is about what normally happens. We just, we can't tell. So. Noted. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. All right. Um, our next item is policies and first reading of policies. So the people responsible for each of these are listed in your packet. If you have any questions regarding any of them, uh, please reach out to Rose and potentially the uh, staff member responsible for them. And then uh, at the next meeting, we will consider them after the review or if they have to be modified, we'll deal with all that at the next meeting. Sound good? All right. Uh, reports. Uh, HCU HEA. Jill, yeah, you, you're. Oh, right. Okay, Jill Golay, Hillsborough Education Association president. And tonight, I just wanted to focus a few minutes on. Um, are some of our teachers that retired. We had 18 teachers that retired and I had the privilege of celebrating with seven of the teachers at Pumpkin Ridge. We have a big event at Pumpkin Ridge Golf Course every year and it's tons of fun. And I just wanted to share what I have learned. Um, Laura McBroom uh, has been with the district or what, 24 out of 26 years as an educator. Viva Sims Cochran, 27 out of 36 years. Sandy Jo Edelfison, 15 out of 20 years. Lisa Rappelier, 19 out of 23 years. Barbara Furstenberg, 39 out of 40 years as an educator. Barbara Schranz, 
33 and a half out of 34. And Brad Greenwood, 33 out of 33 at Hillsborough School District. And so it was really awesome to share uh, with those folks. And we asked them, what advice do you have for educators? Hmm. And I want to read to you a few things that they said. Never, ever give up on a child. Deep down, they all want an emotional connection to you. Always choose what is best for kids. Enjoy the kids. Don't get too wrapped up in the paperwork if you are a special education educator. It's the bond with kids, parents, and coworkers that matter. Keep believing and trust your own instincts. Take time to have great fun and great adventures. Building relationships is more important and has the largest impact in the classroom. The trends come and go, but relationships are forever. And definitely a common theme and thread there. And I asked them, well, what are your plans? And they said, travel, reading, grandkids, quilting, baking, writing children's books, wine making and tasting, enjoying the great outdoors. And so I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate our retirees. And then the last thing I wanted to quickly say, I wanted to share a little bit about a, an award that we give every year um, at this time at this event. And it's called the Linda Ellsworth Award. I never have, have not had the opportunity, never had the opportunity to meet Linda. I know some of you in the room are probably nodding going, oh, I know Linda or I knew Linda. But here's a little bit about the award. In 1994, the old HEA created a special service award when longtime member Linda Ellsworth retired after 30 years of teaching. Linda had served HEA at almost all levels as an officer, building rep, bargaining team member, and OEA RA delegate, to name a few. She literally became our bargaining historian because of her involvement. And in recognition of her long-term commitment to her local association and OEA members, HEA named the HEA Special Service Award after Linda, um, and she was our first recipient. And I wanted to share that last Friday um, at our annual HEA retirement, Joanne Conroy, who is in the room, who did not know what I was going to say tonight, is our 2022 Linda Ellsworth recipient. And it's just testimony to Joanne that she's here tonight beside me volunteering her time. Um, and I just wanted to honor Joanne and honor our, our educators and honor the longevity. So. Melody, are you with us? Looks like we have you. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so good evening. And um, HCU would like to express our sincere heartache for the staff and families that were impacted by the shooting in Texas. Our hearts go out to those that were injured and the families that lost their loved ones in the tragic act of violence that took place at Robb Elementary School. Um, so... There are just 17 days until the, from the end of the school year. It is hard to believe that we've made it all the way through an in-person school year, and that feels pretty good. Sometimes it was a little rocky, but we made it. And I would like to thank everyone that did their part to stay safe and healthy. And with the number of COVID cases on the rise, again, I urge everyone to continue to do their part to stay safe and to keep everyone around them safe. Looking back on this school year, we did some pretty great things. We ratified a great contract for the classified staff. And in that contract, we were able to secure a stipend for bilingual interpreters, a longevity bonus for those that have been in the district for 15 or more years, an increase for those that opt out of insurance, and an increase to our insurance pool to help buy down the insurance premiums for those that do take the insurance. We were also able to increase the wages for all classified employees by seven to 8%. All of these changes, I am very grateful to the HCU bargaining team, along with all of the members that turned out to vote and to ratify this contract. So thank you. The proud to, a the proud to be HSD festival was at the Saturday market on May 14th. 
And it was great to see a lot of staff, students, and families, and even some board members show up to the festival. Many schools had booths, as well as many of the clubs within the schools. And HCU had a booth where kids could make a proud to be button so they could show what they were proud of. And we also gave away books, and we were able to give away over 100 books on that day. And we put books in the hands of students and community members, and it was great to see the smiles on their faces as they selected books to take home to read. HCU is hoping to have more events next year to put more books in the hands of students to encourage the love of reading. And as we transition into summer, we hope that all staff get a much deserved rest. So going into next school year, we can meet all of the challenges with a renewed and vigorous attitude. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. All right, discussion time. I guess students in whatever order you would prefer. <laughs> Every day we have to fight with the microphone, at least a little bit, today more than most. Um, I actually have a little bit to get through today, but I'll try to keep myself concise as best as I can. Uh, last Friday, Glencoe High School had a walkout for reproductive rights, which both Michelle and I attended. Um, and I think it was a really good reminder for me of something that I've tried to keep in mind my entire way through my service as a student representative and will continue to keep in mind for the rest of my life. And that is that it's not just the three of us who stand up here before the board today who care about our community, about civic engagement, about making the world a better place. Um, it is hundreds of people in our schools, not just the people who walked out that day, but pretty much every student I talk to, when you get them talking about issues like this, will tell you what they think, and they'll tell you what you, they think pretty frankly. Um, but at that rally, I asked people towards the end of the event um, if they had ever felt like they had had somebody tell them or imply to them that because they were a teenager, their opinion or voice did not matter. And I can't think of a hand in that crowd that wasn't raised. So I think that that's something to keep in mind um, as we go forward into this. This job of student representatives is important and I'm happy to be here, um, but there's always room for more. Some of you may know of my mother. She's worked in education for a very, very long time, pretty much her entire career. Um, and I grew up in a household that was very big into improvement science. So my mom always talks when I'm trying to deal with a problem and she's helping me about reminding me to design with people instead of for people, to not assume that you know what is best for a community that you are trying to help, but instead ask them, what do you need and how can we help you do it? And I think that what I've seen from this board is that we're pretty good at making time and space for people to talk. You have us sitting up in front of the board. You have invite all of the PACs to give regular presentations. Um, and I really hope that we can translate what we heard from them today into action to continue design and try to design with instead of for. We got a list of requests from the Black Village today let's make them happen. They're all pretty eminently reasonable. Let's at least make sure that we have data to work for. Um, I know that this is all three of our last meeting when we will still be high school students. We have one more meeting before our terms of service are over, but all of us will have graduated by June 20th. Um, so it really does feel like things are coming to an end. And But I know that I'm not done looking at Hillsborough, even though I'm leaving the country in August. That's strange to say out loud, but I'm officially enrolled. Uh, but I think that that's my hope as I walk away as a student representative for the district is that we can see that we're not just listening to people. We aren't just creating a space for people to talk, but we're turning around and implementing what's said uh, because that's how we make really, that's how we make real actual change that improves people's lives, that makes sure students are getting the best possible educational opportunities. Um, and that's what our work here is all about. So thank you. Um, Chris, I want to acknowledge like um, things um, like what happened in Texas um, and also like, um, and also like uh, the other victims of gun violence and um, 
that aren't that you know the the gun the victims of gun violence that also don't get on the news and aren't talked about as much too um and i think that like sometimes like especially when we look at the news um and we see a lot of these things going on in the world it can be an extremely lonely and um painful experience um uh, you know we have the shooting and then like other things going on in other countries within our own country and then, then like um it could feel extremely painful um and it's hard as uh, like because you know they're just ordinary people like us um and they were just living their lives and that was robbed from them um and i I'm trying to learn how to be, um, you know, more present in my own life and be more grateful for the things that I have. Um, and I know that, like, um, but I also, after the walkout um, on Friday, um, and it, I, I talked about this message of hope. And that even though um, there are sometimes scary things going on, even if... Y- you're only, it seems like you're the only one reading it. When you step outside that door, like when I, when, like I, I walked out to the flagpole, walking there, I was the only one in the hall. And then I turned and I saw hundreds of people. And then you realize that like other people are in this fight too. And you realize that like, yeah, that will be a moment that will live with me for the rest of my life. When when we give, we don't have we 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 were talking. We had a circle and um, people were sharing their thoughts, and um, we didn't have a megaphone for a good hour. Um, but people were still standing up there without a megaphone and shouting to a crowd about what they believe in, what they want, what they hope for. And I think that was extremely impactful for me. Um, And like knowing that, like, for example, like these aren't just trends. These aren't just little moments in time, but like, these are things that like, that people care about. Um, And I think that that was really impactful for me. Um, And um, yeah, so (laughs) there's that. Um, And then, so I, I, I guess I, I just wanted to share that. And then the other, um, I um, kind of changing topics. Last week, I was talking to one of the janitors at Glencoe High School. Um, and we were talking and she was talking about how she was like, you know, the janitors here, they, they work 10 to 13 hours a day. They're the first to come in, the last to leave. Um, and you know, they're always there. And even if they're understaffed, they always get the work done. Um, and I just wanted, and I was like, wow, I, like, how, is there any way that we could help? Like, is there any way that like, I, I've been part of a lot of student volunteer organizations. Is there any way that, you know, students can help you in any way to line that load? And she was like, well, you can't, even if you wanted to, you would have, we can only have students help us if you've done something wrong. And I'm like, why is that? So like, I can only help you as a punishment. I can't help you because I want to. And uh, the the band concert was starting by then and people were waiting for me. And I was, I was, so I had to hurry up and I was like, okay, I finished this conversation. But that left an impression on me. And I felt like, I I feel like I have to say that. Um, You know, I think, if we have a group of people that are working so selflessly and so hard, and then we also have a group of people that are willing to help them, I don't see why they can't. Um, and then, um, yeah, so there's that. So then I guess, too, on a more brighter note, um, tomorrow's senior project night. Um, that's going to be really exciting. It's going to be fun. Yes, yeah, Steph and I are going to be there at Glencoe High School. Um, where a lot of seniors are presenting projects that they've been working on, portfolios they've been working on uh, for not just this year, for basically their whole high school career. Um, I think it'll be an exciting night uh, where I get to see a lot of my peers' work. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. I feel like this has been a really disjumbled 
uh, talking and I kind of ramble a lot, so I'm going to end it here. But yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, just like Michelle was saying, my senior project night was actually yesterday and I did it on being on the board. Um, and I just talked about how amazing this opportunity has been because I got to represent students from my school, students who look like me and students who might not always be represented, students who aren't the ones who are going to apply and who aren't the students that are seen as the leader students. Um, and that has been an amazing opportunity because my entire time on the board, I might be the face of and the person who's talking, but it's been them that has guided me and who have given me their input. Um, but I just wanted to take this time to thank you for this amazing experience. Um, you have all made a huge impact on me. I loved my time on the board and um, I think I might want to return, but as an elected member, um, I will be here for a while. Um, and it, this has just been an amazing, an amazing opportunity. I'm so glad I was able to be here with all of you guys this year. I know it's in and out a little bit because I'm also part of the Youth Advisory Council. Um, but I don't know if I mentioned that I will be going to Lewis and Clark next year. So I will be close by, uh, which is very excited, exciting because I'm first generation and the first in my family to go to a four-year university. So I'm very excited for that. Um, and I just wanted to thank Mike for giving me my letter recommendation. I read those all the time when I feel down and like, I cannot do this. I read those and I'm like, I guess I can do this. Um, but I just wanted to thank you all. Um, and on a fun note, prom was on Saturday, super fun. We got all dressed up. We had a great time. Um, and then yesterday, um, not only was it my senior project night, but it was also our May Fate community assembly. And I was part of the court, the May Fate court slash student of the year court. So I'm very excited. I was very happy about that. Um, but yeah, that's it. That, I just wanted to add some positivity on there, um, especially during times right now, it can be a little bit difficult. And I'm so glad that I was able to be part of the board this year. And I'm very sad to be ending my time here. But like I said, I might come back. Um, and I hope to see you all at graduation, at, or most of you at graduation. Um, it'd be an honor to have you guys there. Mike, what do you have to add, add tonight? Uh, we will definitely be there. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to it. Um, and uh, you'll have a lot of supporters if you decide to run for school board. So. Would love to see that down the road. Just want to highlight two celebrations that occurred. Uh, we did have the air show this last week, this last weekend, and uh, Travis and Brooke were both uh, big parts of that. Um, they uh, did some presentations and rubbed some elbows with all the right people. And so thank you for your work there. Also, as was mentioned before, we did have the Proud to be HSD Festival. So thank you to Beth and her team. That is an incredible lift to get that up and running. Um, so thank you for all of that and to create those opportunities for students. And Yadira, we will, you, I've made my comments before, but we'll miss you and we appreciate you. Monique, do you have anything to add tonight? I do. Um, first, I wanna say, um, as been the theme tonight, my thoughts and prayers are with the families um, of Texas and that tremendous loss of life and those 21 souls. I also want to thank everyone who labors in the district for keeping our students, our staff, our faculty, everyone uh, connected with the school district safe. Um, thank you all for the presentations tonight. Uh, they're usually informative and um, helpful. So I uh, just wanna say thank you to everyone. Wish the student reps all the best in all their um, activities and adventures that are coming up in their lives. Um, and the same to you, dear. Again, best wishes on all your endeavors. Thanks. 
Erica, anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I, I think similarly, like everybody today has been kind of a heavy day just because of the events. And um, it's just a constant reminder that, you know, we need to do more than what we're doing because it's too common, too reoccurring, and it's sickening and it's just awful. Um, so we need to move on from, you know, just well wishes to communities, but really figure out how do we change our society so that this doesn't continue to happen. Um, so that's just kind of sitting with me tonight and thinking about that. Um, and I, I think there's so many things that are that have been said today about things um, ending and, you know, kind of the end of things. But I also think it's just new beginnings. And I think that that's a way that we should think about um, as we wrap up our new, our, our school year, about how do we start thinking about our new beginnings and our students having new beginnings and new exciting adventures that await you. Um, and also for our board and a lot of work that needs to be done as we mentioned in our work session. So I just wanna um, thank all of our staff and administration and, and just constantly riding this wave of new beginnings with us. So thank you. Lisa, anything to add? Sure. Um, so uh, first, uh, a shout out to Alaska Airlines for making awesome things happen for the students at Witch Hazel Elementary School. Um, in the last couple of weeks, um, the third through fifth graders got to go on a very fancy charter bus to OMSI, and they were quite the big deal. Um, they were very excited about themselves and had a super mega blast. Um, and similarly, the uh, fifth and sixth grade students were invited to attend the Alaska Airlines Aviation Day at Portland Airport on Saturday and also got chartered there like a big deal. Um, so, I mean, the, the seats have footrests. So it was it was intense. And they they had a great time learning all about um, careers in aviation and um, meeting all sorts of different folks who work in aviation from pilots to mechanics and um, how to take those pathways in life. So it was awesome. And we appreciate them. And speaking of which, Hazel Elementary, just a little plug for the annual Wolf Walk, which is happening on Thursday. And if you'd like to help either one of my children be the top earner, because right now they have my $15, they would appreciate it. So just let me know. I'm happy to sign you right up um, anytime. Uh, and then uh, I, I'll also share my, uh, in, the, in the collective sadness, um, in the news from Texas, I have to say that... Um, this was my first time um, learning of such a tragedy while being in the room with students who were learning about it at the same time. Uh, and that hits much differently um, than it ever has before. And uh, my students who are juniors and seniors in, in a different district uh, in high school uh, shared with me today that they had never had a year in school when they hadn't had this experience. And uh, there aren't words to express how incredibly appalling that is. So that'll be um, where I will end my thoughts tonight. Nancy, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I, so I'm going to reverse this. I'm going to, I just want to say that um, I hadn't quite gotten over what happened in New York. Hadn't finished processing. Hadn't finished trying to hold on to my six foot two, 16 year old black child, male child, who can be stopped at any time. I'm still trying to process um, the people who have said, who have said to my husband at Washington Square Mall, you shouldn't mess with other people's cars because he was getting out of his own Tesla. I haven't finished processing all of that. Don't let the color of my skin fool you. I still have red blood. I still have white blood cells. I am still a human being. 
People who look like me are human beings. People who look like you are human beings. And it is extremely difficult for me to function and compartmentalize and still perform in a world who will never see me as the wonderful human being that I am. I'm urging our teachers, do not forget that black or brown child that you see in your classroom. Do not fear their parents, do not fear their culture. Get comfortable with your discomfort. The moment you do that, your world will open up. I promise you. If there is anything that I can do to help facilitate a conversation or open up a safe space and have that, I am happy to do. But please, please do not take your fear out on our children. I beg of you. Ending on a happier note. I, I admit I'm a I'm a big Dr. Seuss fan. I'm sorry, I can't deny it. And it is always this time of the year that I think of the same. I go back to my favorite book, Oh, the Places That You Will Go, to my beloved student representatives, and to Yadira. One of my favorite uh, two or three pages. He says, you have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know. And you are the one who will decide where to go. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Thanks for the amazing Proud to be HSD Festival. It was great to see HCU, HSF, HEA, like all the acronyms, the district vaccination trailer. And you would be, yeah, all the big robots were in their little pens and little robots. And when they took the big robot out sort of by the street, you would be sort of amazed at how fast that thing goes. It was it's going around to the little pen. You're like, oh, yeah, cute. And, wow. Uh, but of course... The very first thing that happened to me as I walked down second towards the Proud to Be HSD Festival was get, in, get inside Saturday Market HSD Festival. And I saw Yadira and her daughter walking together, of course. So we'll give you the final word. Anything to add to Oh, no, that was, we learned how to do CPR on a dog, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. And I was just, as we were just talking, I, I remember the CCP presentations that we received that were starting with the kiddos at a young age. And that festival was awesome because like, I can see her little mind working. She, she was like, it was awesome to see her with like a high school student learning how to do CPR and a dog. She did robotic stuff. She loved the mariachi band and it just, you know, you can see her little imagination, like just going everywhere and then like earlier that week too she's like mom do you know what an architect is and I'm like oh, no she's like yeah we had one at school today and so I mean just that at work is amazing to see because like her her imagination and like her sense of what she can be is just whatever she wants it to be so um that was great and um I think I'm gonna end it there before there's more crying. <laughs> we'll see y'all in June. We are adjourned. Thank you.